Books Basement uh, Capital Discussion Group, uh, not to be confused with the official zero, Capital Reading Group. Uh, and uh, here we're doing a chapter 14, uh, the division of labor and manufacture. Uh, so this is the uh, chapter in Marx's Capital uh, in which he uh, most directly addresses the question of the division of labor. Um, first, I just want to start. Did you guys have anything you want to say about that to kick it off? Hmm. Well, uh, before the broadcast started, I was talking with Elliot a little bit about how here in my city, we see a lot of businesses where this uh, specific things that we're talking about are happening a lot. And I'm thinking that probably uh, in Canada, in the United States, this sort of thing happened maybe 50, 60 years ago. Because mm -hmm. there's a deepening of the division of labor in Mexico. In other words, yeah, right, going on right now. Okay. Yeah, which is correspondent with, I suppose, uh, automation and increasing industrialization in general. Yeah, which to my to my uh, understanding already happened in the United States. Yeah, until the labor until the labor divides so much that there's no longer labor to do. Right. That's the other. <laughs> yeah. That's the, the the end game. Um, yeah, it was funny because actually we we started out, and I'm gonna I'm just gonna run through and summarize some of the sections in the chapter in a second with the help of uh, Ernesto and Elliot. But we started talking about this before we went live, uh, and Ernesto he said, "Well, I'm I'm very was familiar I'm familiar with the themes of this chapter because I work in a factory, uh, you know, the division of, of of labor, right, and also the division between head and hand and labor, right, which is here." Uh, and I said, well, I'm very familiar. No, I didn't say this, but what I was thinking to say <laughs> was I'm also very familiar with the division between head and hand and labor because I'm a philosopher. <laughs> so <laughs> I have first-hand experience oh, with the division between head and hand and labor. Um, You're right, but, though. It's true. I mean, yeah, but, you know, and that's it's what I, I do want to... So this primarily deals with... Yeah, like This deals more heavily with, it's true, like themes of manufacturing and so forth. Um, but yeah, it's important to remember that the obverse of that, right? Uh, you know, is the performance of uh, intellectual labor, um, you know, whether it's it's uh, administrative, right, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in the context of a corporation or whether it's, um, you know, more indirect in its relationship to the overall superstructure, which I think you could say of philosophy. And philosophy is what? It's really, you know, the theology of the state, right? Um, so, or the theology of the post-state, we're talking about Deleuze. <laughs> um, but a uh, little shot at Deleuze there. Okay, so uh, the other thing, Ernesto, uh, the other thing, Ernesto, you pointed out before we started was um, the sort of the progress in your factory of when when it went from less automated to suddenly there was an automated machine which created the the phenomenon of the craftsman who was very familiar with the product and workings of the product, and then it created this new craftsperson who was alienated from the actual product in terms yeah. of they now they were now um, utilizing the machine, which has its own sort of things you need to do, but it's a but it's sort of like alienated from the final uh, product. So then one becomes familiar with the machine or their or their determinant end within the manufacturing process, but not the actual product. And they're sort of they they become a different sort of, you know, as Mark said, what he he says it so um, dramatically, right? The distorted, grotesque, <laughs> or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, a crippled monstrosity. A crippled monstrosity. There it is. The labor becomes a crippled monstrosity. You know, <laughs> subject. Sub, well, that's. I think that's in relation to the capitalist using this, sort of um, exploiting this aspect. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah well, we, well, we can get into discussing it more. I think now we should just go through and, um, if you guys agree, just try to run through the sections. And I, I read, uh, you know. A little bit. I read the first part of it last night after having consumed several Heineken, so my memory might be uh, a little <laughs> bit foggy. But you know, I am doing a thesis on Marx, so I should be able to piece this together. Okay, so uh, we have the the dual origin in manufacture, right? Which is sure. the first section, um, and in that um, uh, combination of variables. Yeah. So what this is describing, I suppose, is the way that you, in the in the age of manufacture, right? You have you have sort of sites of manufacturing, right? But that often what you have, uh, he says here, um, one capitalist simultaneously employs in one workshop a number of craftsmen, craftsmen who all who do all do the same work, or the same kind of work, such as making paper, type, or needles. Uh, this is cooperation in its simplest form. Uh, each, each of these craftsmen makes the entire commodity and he consequently performs in succession all the operations necessary to produce it, right? So in this kind of context, like one sort of craftsman with the help of perhaps a couple of apprentices will independently create the commodities, right? 
Um, so that's that's how that functions. But um, what you see here later on, right? You know, with the uh, sorry, this is uh, so this is handicrafts we're talking about. Pardon me. What you see later with the development of the division of labor and manufacture uh, is you see an increasing specialization in division of labor, right? So more and more uh, we see that essentially uh, individual workers, right, are tasked with only completing a kind of fragmentary part of the entire process, right? You know, and then it's the uniting of those different roles, right, uh, that, um, you know, is responsible for the creation of the commodity, right, in the context of, and that increasingly becomes the case uh, in manufacture. Right? Um, so he talks a little bit here about the headsets falling off. Ah. He talks the a little bit here about, effect. yeah, this, this is my, keeps... I lost my, my really, you know, fighter pilot headset. Um, so he talks a bit here about the specialized worker and his tools. Um, so he talks here about, and then he goes on about, in section three, we see the two fundamental forms of manufacture, heterogeneous and organic. Um, and again, here we see a contrast that's established between um, this sort of heterogeneous production right, and the increasing uh, pursuit of organic production, right, uh, and this is also obviously contingent upon the process of automation, right, because it's automation um, and effectively a process of de-skilling, right, that makes it possible for this division to kind of enact itself, right. Um, so, of course, he, he discusses, like, you know, the thought of people like Adam Smith, right, in relation to that development, um I, I sort of always struggle with um why marxists are so sort of on, or why what the focus on adam smith with marx I, why is why is he sort of the necessary touchstone for marx you think well he was the he was the founder of modern political economy right yeah. so like before adam smith the only yeah. economics you had was like you have antecedents to it in um in the uh the physiocrats and even going back to Aristotle, right, where Aristotle tries to find like uh, the common basis of exchange, for example, um, in his writings, which Marx discusses actually in the first three chapters of Capital. Um, yeah. But he was the first one that kind of tried to map and evaluate uh, the structure and achievements of um, a society in which uh, it was increasingly industrialized, in which the division of labor was widespread. Right. So okay. You can actually you can trace the you can trace the the basis of the labor theory of value. Well, I mean. Marx doesn't really have a, a labor theory of value, right? He has like a value theory of labor, but you can trace that back to Smith's work, right? It ends up being formulated different by, differently by Marx, um, but yeah. I think the first the first sort of exposition of that in economic terms is in Smith, right? But it, it, like in Smith, it gets modified, right? Because of uh, the intervention of fixed capital, right? And the effect that has, um, because Smith doesn't have, I mean, we have to, We'd have to discuss the relationship between fixed and constant capital and the differentiation of their, their definitions. But to try to make a long story short, um, Smith doesn't bracket the, the notion that um, uh, machines, for example, can create value in the way that Marx does. Yeah. Right? So Smith kind of starts, Smith starts with a sort of anthropological or ontological labor theory of value, which is not the Marxist entregume, labor theory of value. Um, and then later he, argues that it's effectively modified, right, through the uh, the intervention of, of material, other material supplements, right? Um, whereas Ricardo will actually defend um, like a strong version of the sort of ontological or ontotheological labor theory of value, right? And Ricardo is the, you know, the one, the only person you can unambiguously, unambigu unambiguously associate with the cliche image of the labor theory of value. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I think it's the it's the mapping of economics, but specifically the centrality of labor that Marx, you know, approaches from a left wing standpoint that makes Smith uh, and and Ricardo is even more important than Smith, by the way, to to Marx. Right. Why is he more important qualitatively? <laughs> Why is he more important? He's more important. Um, he's more important uh, because the again um, his mapping of the relationship like for him like uh labor has a more central relationship to the production of value than in smith right um so you know i think i think in a lot of ways like if you want to try to understand um the genesis of marx's mature work it's based on an identification he perceives between and like uh lukash observes this in the young hegel it's based on an identification he perceives between um the centrality of like uh, 
labor as exertion or the human actant in the work of Hegel. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. and, and the way that this is expressed in the political economy of Ricardo and then retroactively okay. through Smith, right? So Marx is trying to, trying to figure out like, well, why is it that there seems to be this focus in our society? How can we contextualize that? How can we enlarge this analytic, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Well, that's, very, that's a very nice explanation. Yeah. Okay. I, I was, it, yeah. It's probably tinier than it actually I is feel the like, truth. But. I feel like I should double down on all my ignorance here because it, 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 it creates a nice little, uh, a di uh, like a split between like okay Conrad Conrad's the one who's supposed to know. <laughs> well, you're, you're, a true, you're a true you're a true exemplar. You're not just a practitioner. You're an exemplar of psychoanalysis in that your your failures are also productive, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Precisely. I'll stand yeah. by that absolutely. <laughs> um, so we, then we kind of progress and we see a really so again some of this stuff early on I think is a little bit more methodological the formulation but we see a really interesting um, when you talk point here when Marx talks about the division of labor and manufacture and the division of labor in society mm -hmm. because there what he stresses is that uh, as the division of labor in society becomes more anarchic it becomes like this coincides with it being more despotic or regulated in the factory so in other words like um, you know yeah okay uh, you know the ascription of gender in some ways might be challenged, right, to give you an example, by the large role that women were playing, right, in, in the industrial workforce, right? Um, but that's okay, right, because there's a structuration and division of labor within, like, the factory system, for example, that allows it to function, right? So in other words, like, the division of, of labor within the factory actually subordinates the broader social division of labor, right, and, and has a certain yeah. effect on it, right, which is a really interesting point for, for discussions of social reproduction, right? Um, well, it takes it to a, it creates a sort of, it reproduces it, but it creates a sort of second sort of thing entirely, like a sort of second tier version of the initial social relation or something like that. Yeah, and reading, like, through, reading through, I was surprised by how direct the addressal of social reproduction was here. Because sometimes people are like, oh, capital is just a critique of political economy. And it's like, well, it is, but that's a pretty strong allusion to broader social implications. Yeah. So here yeah. he discusses the cap, then we're just in section five. Uh, he discusses the capitalist character of manufacture, um, some of the antinomies, right, between like the individuation of the wage labor and, and its collective structure, which we went over earlier. Um, yeah. the, the, how, how workers, a lot of this deals with de-skilling, how workers are kind of you know, robbed of a certain agency that they previously exercised in the domain of handicrafts, for example, yeah. um, where they become like limbs of a larger apparatus. This analysis reaches its fruition in the next very, very long chapter uh, on machinery and large scale industry. And then some very, very, I'm just gonna say here finally, we have some very, very provocative comments about um, the division of labor between head and hand um, and how it developed in an ancient context. And also okay. how, like how the division of labor was naturalized in an ancient context in relation to their societies um but how it, it was interestingly and this speaks to the lack of development of let's say uh abstract labor in that context though i would argue unlike Poston, for example the abstract labor did exist sort of avant la lettre um we the idea that in ancient societies the writers when they talked about division of labor they always indexed that question to use value not exchange value right so there's an inherent yeah. division of labor that's you know ontologically specified or ought to be pursued um, and that is optimal, right, for the production of use value. So it's not treated. So again, this if you're asking me what the importance of Smith was, I would say the importance of it is that he get, like Smith makes the distinction of values and use and values and exchange. Um, yeah. So he, he's the first one to provide an analytic of economics that pivots strongly toward an analysis of exchange. Right, that would okay. be the, yeah. Um, this chapter really sort of outlines, I think. Okay, I think, that, I think that's a good summary. By the way, I'm just gonna say, I think that's fine with oh, yeah. the summary, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, the, the idea that we become, as we become more technologically advanced, that we lose skills is very counterintuitive. And that sort of marks, outlines how that happens. And that's sort of a... Oh, I, mean, I can do Oh, that. you have, still have admin controls. <laughs> nice. we, we need to give everyone admin, Ernesto, I'll give you the link after oh, as well. Perfect. <laughs> Yeah. So we just, we can start be you know, the problem is when we when we when we go through when we if we wait till the end to answer questions, we're just going to fall behind. So maybe we should try to answer a few of the things the audience would like okay, to have. Sure, just sure. Out. And then we can use that as a jump, a startup point to discuss other things, too. Um, yeah. 
I'm actually writing a short story on the twofold origin of manufacture. Sweet. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, Rafael Landa Aragon. He's uh, he's from the same state as I am. I'm also from Durango, and apparently he's writing uh, about a manufacturing business uh, of guitars. Right, a familiar guitar business. He says. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, I, I love it. By the way, I just want to say quickly that I love that you're from Durango because, you know, one of my favorite Bob Dylan songs is Romance in Durango. Okay. You know, uh, Hot chili peppers in the blistering sun. <laughs> Wait, I, 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 have, I, have, I, have a, I have a banner for this one. We already have a banner for this one. Oh, <laughs> perfect. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so let's get forward. I just wanted to ask Rafa if they're going to, uh, I hope they keep commenting. Do they have a uh, experience uh, in guitar manufacturing? Uh, are they drawing from their real life experiences? Because Durango is a small town, so they might be. Uh, yeah, that would be interesting. So I just want to say Petty, so we can go go if they answer that. William Petty, Marx says, is the founder of modern political economy. Yeah, I haven't traced like the genealogy of Marx's statements on who's the founder of modern <laughs> political economy, but I do think that obviously Adam Smith is particularly crucial. Uh, in this tradition, right? And, you know, he, he talks about other people too, right? Like Malthus plays a, a crucial role in his formulations. Um, okay, so th this is what this is what I thought was interesting. Daniel Jacobs, who I believe was the person who was torturing me last time about abstract labor and slavery, is back uh, yeah. to further torture me, um, <laughs> which is what you guys do, right? Ricardo is trying to do Adam Smith in the era of large scale manufacture, and so becomes contradictory. Ricardo's value is an expression of transition. Um, okay, I mean, I, I don't really know exactly how to respond to that. I guess you would say that it's an expression of transition insofar as it mediates between um, Smith's claim that labor is not, you know, as such the basis of value in the age of manufacture, as I would understand it, if there's Smith scholars here, let me know. Um, and Marx's uh, not, let's say, equivocation between labor and value, but kind of looking at labor as the substratum of exchange value production. Um, okay, Let's see. Barbon and Locke already made a separation between use and value and use and exchange. Yeah, I mean, I think you can actually, I think even in Aristotle, there's there's proto formulations. Um, the means for the development of productive forces becomes obsolete in the era of large scale machinery. Okay, okay, well, I think that that's good for what we want to. But let's just shift. So do you guys have any thoughts on the, the chapter in general? Well, like I said, the biggest implication, and just to repeat, is that as technology increases, we don't, I think there's an idea is like the, the individualist sort of idea, I think, or notion is like technology increases. Ergo, my capacity as a human increases with technology. I have now this great technology. Um, and then... So Marx does a good job of sort of outlining why that's why that's not true, and I see that a lot. I work in a I work in a you know the government sponsored you know therapy clinic because we have like a certain level of pay that you know once you get your license you can kind of enter into these various you know whoever you are if you're not like if, if you have a if you have a basic ability to write and keep up with stuff you can enter into these various systems for a kind of like low 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 medium sort of pay uh but you can be a therapist and you work with people who um have like very low income or no yeah or no income uh through the state's insurance right and there's so many people that have these very specified uh, administrative tasks that have been doing them for like 20 years in um like therapy and therapy clinics that have to do with um the various not even like software, but like just utilizing certain software mm -hmm. and running through these various small sort of in parts of this administrative chain that goes through this billing process to the state. Um, and it is really interesting because, you know, you talk to somebody who's been working in one of the, one of the jobs for like 20 years or something like that. And um, you really get the sense that they are isolated from the mental health aspect of it. Like totally, they're totally isolated from it which is really interesting um, when you think about it. And I think medical, medical biller for people in like South Central, uh, 
so the sort of poor area of Los Angeles, um, you hear a lot of people that are like, they're like really about the state in terms of like, I want to work for the state or I want to be a medical biller. Yeah. Uh, you go towards the sort of petty bourgeois areas. You never, you never would hear anyone say something like that. But, um, you know, because it is that consistent paycheck, it's like I can learn this one skill in this one sort of area and I will be able to survive. This is really good. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, but then they, you know, they learn the skill and they, they're, you know, they're fully dependent on that skill within, you know, the machine goes. Um, there, It's a tough time because you have to sort of transfer to, it doesn't necessarily immediately go into private business. Um, but yeah, so the increase of technology, uh, increasing alienation from the final product, uh, absolutely something to think about when we go forward mm -hmm. and as technology continues to improve and accelerate. Uh, anyway, well, and yeah, and I, I think that's interesting. I think that's interesting, <laughs> yeah. I think that's interesting too, because it shows like for me, it depends on the, yeah. on the level of public financing, but um, obviously, but for me, um, you know, something like therapy, which in one way or another often, you know, is the recipient of public sub subsidies, right? Um, occupies uh, a kind of a somewhat like an interesting and ambigu ambiguous position uh, with respect to, I guess what Mia Gonzalez, for example, will call like directly market mediated activities and indirectly market, market mediated activities. So for example, like, um, you know, the domestic labor of a woman insofar as it's not remunerated or waged right would be would be indirectly market mediated where directly market mediated would be the performance of wage labor but like <clears throat> it's kind of interesting if we talk about government sectors right uh like for marx that would be unproductive labor like you know public education for example um but it's deigned to be significant enough um to the overall reproduction of capital and value um that uh you know it in turn is subsidized so there's a weird like there's a weird uh ambiguity in those fields because on one hand i think you have a certain uh, freedom from the immediate injunction uh, to to reproduce capital, but on the other hand, right, they become structured based on like a society in which the exchange abstraction is dominant, right? Um, and so I think that that's going to favor, for example, like the adoption, and I don't know, maybe you know, even in like a perfect left society, we would have, you know, a lot of streamlined administrative practices. I don't know, nor do I want to speculate on that right now, but uh, you can see how there's the adoption of administrative practices that are more characteristic of. Um, industries, for example, which are more directly governed by the need to reproduce capital, right? Which I think is, is what you're getting at, right, Elliot? Yeah. Also, I've seen the I've seen the result of someone becoming less alienated from their labor. While this is like sort of a psychological point, it's like there's a sort of great joy that comes when there is like a sort of integration into the into the greater idea of um, this. I, this is idealism, but there is a there is a you know a sort of a, a sort of feeling when somebody who does work in these sorts of niches somehow I, I through the my uh, the union effort at my place a lot of people sort of reassessed their role in found places other uh, than here and then as soon as they become integrated into the actual therapy process it's like a sort of wow wow moment because you know there is this sort of psychological effect of of um Although Zizek would of course say shut up, but but there because he's like we need more alienation. Fuck you, right? <laughs> um, to to being less alienated from the final product and not necessarily just being the end in the machine. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think it's interesting too because like if you're thinking about <clears throat> what Marx is saying, so Marx actually alludes to the fact that there's like a latent, um, you know, uh, communization of individuals that comes across through the uniting in the factory floor, and we talked about that before. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that in an age where so often the, the implementation of constant capital um, pertain, like explicitly has to do with communications technology, then in a way like the, you know, and I think this would be <clears throat> to some degree, the argument of Negri in like Empire, for example, um, though Negri isn't <clears throat> good. Um, but um, the, it's interesting. Um, but uh, I think, uh, yeah, like you're talking about this feeling of uh, solidarity with the whole. Um, you know, and I think that oh, with, the ethical, with, the, with the ethical idea of the business, right? Yeah. Okay. The so if you, can, if you can put an ethical gloss on it, which is easier in, yeah. in indirect market mediated fields, right. Um, that are valorized nonetheless, that may be possible. Um, but then I think you have like the particular, uh, potential of communications technologies to establish that kind of solidarity, which is debilitated yeah. at the physical level sometimes. And we're seeing an extreme of that with coronavirus. 
at the same moment that it's intensified at the communicative level, if that makes sense. Yeah. Which, 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 would, which, which would give you a means of explaining why, like, you know, often critiques of the new laughter that, like, it's engendered this, like, discursive explosion unaccompanied by practical actions, right? Because um, yeah. you, you can argue that the way, the way, const the way th this constant capital and this division of labor is affecting uh, communization or the solidarity of workers is such that it's like an, a, a, a virtual link more than a physical yeah. one. Right. Yeah, definitely. I like this. I thought the purpose of tech was so I could admit, omit the non-essentials from my being and get on with higher things like the contemplation of beauty and so on, a process of sifting. And then, of course, sure. But there, there's, there's, definitely, there's definitely a price to pay is the one thing. That's the Marxist idea, which is, the anti Jordan Peterson will like look how look how look how great this chart is. It shows that things are going well, mm -hmm. but actually there's a sort of if you miss this sort of split, um, you know, and that's Hegel's sort of idea, and I think the com the communist sort of critique idea, which is these things are split. They're not simply just this positive feedback loop. Um, that you know the tech is like yeah, of course tech medical technologies, other technologies, uh, the end of the idea. But the I, this is what I'm writing about in my book, by the way, which is uh, the ego in its hyperstate, the definitive guide to self, to rational self-interest. <laughs> Good time. Okay, anyway, but, but, one of the, but one of the main points is that the idea is always split into two things. One is the end of the idea. So that's like tech is the, and the second is the more absolute quality is the glue which the idea um, brings people together within a sort of moment or a process, right? So yes, tech tech does serve that purpose, but it also glues people together. And that's a more even consistent because the end of the idea of tech doesn't, you know, it could either fail or succeed. However, it will always function as a potential to glue people in these sorts of formations. And I think Marx, does a good job of outlining exactly how it does that, right? Um, yeah. That's a, with a forward by Conrad Hamilton, uh, by the way. Oh yeah, you want to write for it? <laughs> yeah, on the right. 15th. I feel like I'm writing, a, like I'm back in college. I'm like, shit, this is due on the 15th. You guys can both. Write. <laughs> you want to get some work? I'll toss. I'll toss you. I'll toss you like fifty bucks if you want. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to, if you want to, yeah, five bucks. If you want to, if you want to get someone more famous, I can do the afterward. Um, but I think. Uh, we get Jordan Peterson to the forward, right? I should get like <laughs> I'm honestly I'm about to get every millennial to like write. I'm gonna like toss them all fifty bucks and get them to write a chapter to fill that word count. <laughs> <laughs> it's cheap. It's cheap labor, man. Um, That's okay. So I wanted to go. Short. Can I go back to this quick? I want to. I want yeah, to go back yeah. to that quick thing. And what I wanted to say about it was that, like, it's interesting because actually the most hilarious thing about this is when you, like, I wrote about this and I've been. I actually this is like I think the one time. I've ever been like cited by someone was like on a blog. I forget the name of it, but uh, or the, no, not the one time, but the one time I've been cited on, for my work on Marx, let's say, not as opposed to Jordan Peterson. But um, yeah, someone um, like they were, what I commented on was how uh, you have, and I'm trying to remember the, the name of the book, but I wrote about it a lot in my MA thesis, but it's uh, Andrew Yer, right? Uh, and he was, I believe, he may have been a factory inspector. I, I forget exactly all the details. But uh, Marx comments on his work uh, in Capital, uh, but he wrote a text. Uh, let me see if I can pull it up, the title here, um, which you can find, I think, in PDF form online. Um, Andrew, your book, what did you write? He wrote, uh, he wrote The Philosophy of Manufacturers. Yeah, that's what he wrote. And it's actually really funny in it because in it, he treats, uh, like he treats um, technology this way. Like he's like, it, like, you know, as like creating this like free time, um, so he's like, workers should be happy that we're implementing more technology because like, he's like, their work is getting eliminated so much that soon they're just going to sit around and do absolutely nothing. But what he fails to perceive <laughs> is like, you know, the, what Marx has talked, talks, is, talks about with the general law, right? Um, like, like the basic issue that this is going to generate in terms of engendering unemployment, right? That then like forces, you know, the whole development of 20th century economies, right? In terms of the adoption of socialization as a means of offsetting that uh, and so forth, right? Um, 
So I think that, but I think, I just think that's a really funny thing. Like, yeah, soon workers are just going to sit around and like, you know, do nothing at work and they should be grateful for this. And it's like, oh, <laughs> don't know if it works that way, buddy. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> he also defends like child labor and stuff in the book, which is. Um, oh, that's fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's, what's, gonna, what's, his, what's his defense of child labor? I kind of forget, but like, I think, I think his defense was that like most things that people do in factories now are just hitting buttons anyway. They're not hard. Um, <laughs> so why not have children do it? Do yeah. It. <laughs> uh, and he's like, uh, he's like, it's, I think he might argue it's edifying for them or something to like acquire the virtues of industry sure. or something like that. <laughs> but, <laughs> or not. <laughs> that's, that's a great example of of a of a substantial argument that misses this a lot of elements of what goes in okay by the way right. daniel daniel jacobs i don't know when he, he penned this but he he got me the title there philosophy of of manufacturers um yeah uh i want to say also i for me i thought the most interesting part was actually on the the division of labor in antiquity um Partly the because, like, example of the Indians. Uh, Indian? later, right? I was thinking of the Greek example, which is oh, yeah. the most, most yeah, and we did talk ours. about that last time, yeah. Um, but there was something here, like he says, I think, here, um, social division, yeah, okay, like there's something here where he talks about the um, mm, um yeah here we go so he says so often like you have this dispute right like like one of the things i see as a big problem within i think maybe the biggest problem um i don't you know one of the major problems anyway within marxology is like this like huge debate over because marx often doesn't specify he'll kind of imply like when things happen right because the thing is he's dialectical so it's like you know okay basic example like quantity becoming quality right the change um, so it leads it open to all these debates of like, you know, when did abstract labor start to occur? Like, when did the law of value start to happen? And all these kind of discussions of periodization, basically. And I think the tendency of a lot of Marxist interpreters has been to be far more analytic and less supple and dialectical in terms of how they pursue those kind of things. Um, yeah. But like, so like I know in, um, like, so I know in a lot of value form readings, um, you have a tendency to really bracket uh, like pre-capitalist mode of production history um, and to make, uh, you know, all kind of social relations seem like, you know, they have no sort of prehistory before the capitalist mode of production. But I thought it was interesting here. He says <clears throat> where you should say here, the exchange of products springs up at the point where different families, tribes or communities come into contact. For at the dawn of civilization, it is not private individuals, but families, tribes, etc that meet on an independent footing. Different communities find different means of production and different means of subsistence in their natural environment. Hence their modes of production and living as well as their products are different. It is this spontaneously developed difference which when different communities come into contact calls forth the mutual exchange of products and the consequent gradual conversion of those products into commodities. Exchange does not create the difference between spheres of production but it does bring the different spheres into a relation thus converting them into more or less interdependent branches of the collective production of a whole society. So what's actually in interesting here is like, I think if, if you look at what he's trying to say, it's that um, like there may not have been anything like a manufacturing division of labor within like, you know, uh, tribal or sort of early post-tribal societies, dawn of civilization, right? Okay. Um, but what you do see is that uh, you have the uh, production and exchange of, of commodities and that like um, that within those communities, uh, the cost of producing those commodities becomes relatively standardized, right? Uh, which is the basis for early systems of trade. Well, what can you say about that other than that this is like an extremely, like a very, very localized instantiation um, of uh, abstract labor qua the law of value, right? Now, now, again, the question is like, well, where would you say that that becomes a global phenomenon? I mean, we know today there are places that have very limited interactions with the global market, right? Uh, or the national market or whatever like you know that's that's that that can be that's always there but it just poses this question of periodization right that I wanted to bring up yeah Ernesto any thoughts I'm gonna I'm gonna interpolate you I'm gonna... okay thank you um, I was thinking uh, going a little bit back to the 
whole part about kids. I remember that Marx, uh, I don't know if it was a footnote or the text of the chapter, he mentioned that uh, for the more um, secretive parts of their of their labor division, capitalists will usually uh, employ handicapped people, right? And it made me think a little bit about this new documentary on Netflix. I don't know if you guys have seen it, uh, Tiger King. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, I yeah. I was I reflecting a little bit on how uh, Joe Exotic, that yeah, Joe, Joe Exotic, uh, mm -hmm. hired people who were crippled or are infirm. Or who had been injured, you know, by him, by him, and he kept them, you know, in the little uh, machinery of his uh, yeah, capitalist yeah. production. That now that would be an interesting talk. We could do a whole special on that. <laughs> that would go over well. A Marxist analysis of Tiger King. I mean, why not, right? Yeah. Well, I think you're I think, absolutely right, of course. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that's interesting too because, like, you know, we have to ask ourselves, like, to be a little more fluid about what the definition of like um, handicapped is. I mean, like, there is. It seems to me that there. Um, it seems to me that if you look at the dominant in the West, if you look at the dominant structure of labor, uh, that probably a lot of it, like the cognitive tilt, that's a lot of it. A lot of it is acquired may make it diff more difficult for mm -hmm. people who are, for instance, handicapped to participate in those structures. Um, yeah. But it does also seem to me to be interesting that, like, um, I've been thinking about, like, um, not necessarily handicapped at all, but certain populations that face uh, extreme developmental difficulties, like the Roma peoples in Europe, right, and aren't integrated into the normal labor market, um, you know, and how often um, they sort of become, because you, you were giving the example of Tiger King and what he does, how they sort of become, like, you know, integrated into, into kind of lumpen proletariat structures, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you think of like, if you think of the circus, right, and it's kind of um, genesis and dissemination, right, there's a strong association with Roma cultures. Um, so I thought that was, that's kind of interesting too. It's like, and then like, I wonder, I would speculate, and I don't know, this could be like, on one hand, I think that today, like, you know, some of the, some of the, the pressures of labor force integration may be diminished because of the existence of certain kinds of social subsidies for people who suffer from these issues. Um, but I also wonder if the, there might be a certain exclusionary effect as a, that, that emerges as a consequence of the, in the West, I specify, uh, of the cogn cognitization, if you will, uh, of certain labor processes, right? Um, and then how exactly that would function. I don't know. I haven't read enough on that, but I think that just what do you mean be by the cogn uh, cognitization of a labor process. Well, the fact that a lot of things would be less physical and they'd be more based on, um, like the completion of tasks that have a certain intellectual element. Oh, gotcha. Um, like the cognitariat or whatever. Yeah. Or like, or kind of like, even like that's effective, that's like I, everyone rolling their eyes, everyone on the comment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like this isn't 2002, bitch. <laughs> oh, I love, I love, um, I love the new Mackenzie work one. Uh, the, that posits, uh, the hacker, the hacker, which is recaptured in terms of capital. Yeah. You know, this is, of course the theses are always like, a bit too wild, which is we're out of, we're out of the we're out of capitalism and we're in something worse right which is like highly questionable but in terms of the idea of recapturing the the hacker um agents who is like supposedly they're like oh they're they're skilled they're all knowing they know how to get but that that is of course like the very thing which is um then recaptured into an apparatus and is actually extremely unsubversive uh, to be this sort of like a hacker, uh, you know, in, in between the cracks type, you know. I want to circle. I want to circle back to work in a second. But one thing I want to say is the funniest thing I've read about this uh, recently. So mm -hmm. um, my girlfriend, she loves like pirates. She loves like Pirates of the Caribbean movies. She got me to watch all them great movies, right? Um, and Johnny Depp. I mean, so good. You know, Captain Jack Sparrow. Um, but. Uh, yeah, I think Ernesto's kind of laughing, now. but, uh, yeah, like, but actually in George Cofensis in his book in Letters of Blood and Fire, he claims that the popularity of pirate narratives in the present day, uh, has to do with the way that, uh, the, the idea of like workers seizing control of large masses of constant capital and using it to like subvert the broader dictates of like, uh, value creating society, uh, is, finds its allegory, uh, in the sort of like domain of hacking. Um, so he kind of claims that like, the base of the superstructure of like Pirates of the Caribbean or pirate narratives uh, is actually 
uh, the appropriation of constant capital for hacking, for instance, right? Yeah. I would say, <laughs> I would say I would say the greatest technological hacker of our day is Joe Exotic of Tiger King. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's in that, he, in that, through the breaking of the law. He did create. He created his categorical zoo, which became uh, the yeah. ultimate phenomenon ideal of of the Tiger Zoo as hacker, and yet he's ultimately recaptured perfectly within capitalism. <laughs> that, was yeah. my Zizek, that was my Zizek impression right there. And this is, <laughs> this is why I would say the ultimate technolo technologist is Joe Exotic. <laughs> that's, that's true though. It's true though, because because like, yeah. it's true. Like, this is like the sublation where Elliot makes a joke and I come and I'm like, it's, it's true. Yeah, do it. Uh, um, <laughs> because like, okay, so I understand that he like, he owns his own business, right? And uh, I haven't seen the show. I'm just going off like everyone talking about this. And uh, and like, there's a lot of uh, constant capital, uh, like in the involved in like procuring those animals and stuff like that, right? Um, so in a way, like the structural, it's very different, like in terms of technological mediation. But the structural role of uh, someone like Joe Exotic, I mean, the real question is like, you know, for like, if we're talking about this sort of idea of like, how can the working class become, you know, uh, independently prosperous within a capitalist system without becoming beholden to the to companies that force them to perform wage labor, right? But the big question is how do you how do you wrest control of constant capital, right? Um, so whether that's pirate ships, whether that's tigers, whether that's uh, you know um, uh, digital apparatuses, right? Uh, you know the question, and you could actually say that in a way, like uh, you know, obviously the beneficiaries of this are go like are apropos cognitariat of the tech thing. I think most of them enjoyed a certain level of education. Um, but when you see some of these people, like John McAfee and stuff, you do wonder. Um, but um, like I think the thing about like the thing about that is you did see a certain level of middle middle class prosperity because of the tech boom, and I think one reason for that was uh, it created it, it created like a new domain of accumulation, right? Uh, in which like you know constant capital assets that would subsequently become inaccessible to most people, right? To acquire like look at how centralized and fixed like Facebook is today. We like there was a certain period of time in which there was a lot of competition and everyone could kind of go in. Right and do that. So I think that heart partly helped with the middle class, at least, uh, like uh, mitigate some of the concerns about the general uh, neoliberalization of the economy, among alongside other factors like the cheapening of goods from Chinese manufacturer and lots of things. Right. You know, it's interesting that they said at the very end of Tiger King, what, <laughs> which goes along with the, your point of it. It is sort of the the, the capital process, which. I don't know if this is true or not, or I actually believe it's one of the people who don't like the Tiger King. They said, you know what's interesting about him? He's terrified of tigers. He doesn't even like tigers, really, <laughs> which is like the universal. Like, so he is the ultimate, like, you know, they sort of reveal the non-being of like his of his thing, right? At the very end of the show, like the last episode. Um, I don't know if that's, I can't imagine that's true because I, you know, keep throwing a tiger in your truck or something. I think that requires you a little bravery or some shit. <laughs> not, not in a good way, but it's like I wouldn't, I would not probably be able to do that, right? So he must. I mean, it have. is. I didn't watch the entire series, but it is my impression that he doesn't really like these animals. Yeah. Exactly. Precisely. Right. Yeah. They are a pretty unruly labor force. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe I've transgressed Marxist, Marxist categories. What is the what? Well, what is the machine of uh, what is the isolated labor of the zoo? Is there isolated labor within the Tiger King Zoo, or is it too small for such a thing? I think I think the people that feed the animals is that yeah. isolated labor. I think that I think one of the in fact I think maybe one of the positives of the show is people are not alienated for the, from their labor, right? In terms of here's this guy who's so. At just absolutely like the worst uh, will just abuse the shit out of you. And then the one thing he offers is you are not alienated from your labor in terms of you are like in with the tigers, you're feeding the tigers, you're like, you live with the tigers, you are the tiger person, right? It's the radical opposite of being alienated from your, you know. Yeah, I was thinking that there aren't a lot of TV shows with, where the protagonists are alienated that much from their labor, is it, are there? That are that are alienated from their labor. Yeah, that, that was uh, that's a great question. Where they where you just don't see the end product. I think you you could talk about the office um, 
in terms of how much do we see paper in the office? Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think in the office we see like them delivering paper or they don't, we don't see them manufacturing paper. Um, mm -hmm. we, yeah, we, we which is like weird paper. because here, here's the, my, my thing, what I'm thinking, uh, shows like shark week, no shark tank, right. Uh, and dragons Den and all of those, like they sell a kind of a, like a capitalist who's not alienated from the product of his labor of the labor of his company. Uh, I'm thinking of shows like uh, Kitchen Nightmares, you know, where what people do is they cook food. Uh, same with the Hotel Hell or whatever that they do uh, services. I'm just thinking like there's no shows about, uh, you know, just a factory line, right? Like yeah. People make fridges. Right? There's I Love Lucy. <laughs> oh, is that what it's about? Like just uh... I, I Love Lucy when she makes mega veg of vitamin, but that's like from the 50s and that's like oh, a yeah. one-off, right? Where she's like on the factory line, she's like, can't do it. And it oh yeah, I've seen that clip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but well, you're it's right. interesting. Yeah. It is interesting, like in this level, because I would argue that if you look at earlier sitcoms, right, like mm -hmm. All in the Family or whatever, like they didn't, you know, they wouldn't have focused on the professional sphere because like people's lives began, you know, at like five o'clock when they got off work, right? For sure. Um, yeah. But I think that if we're talking about, uh, you know, and, and again, this is where the cognitary tiger thing, you know, kind of comes up. I think if we're talking about, and you know, I think Mad Men actually would be a great example of this too. Um, but if you're talking about, um, you know, and, and actually Breaking Bad too, because the whole theme in Breaking Bad is like, is kind of like alienation from your labor and the way that he goes to these sort of, in the context of this recessionary United States, he goes to these absolutely hideous and perverse ends uh, to try to kind of overcome that, right? And to achieve this kind of stimulus, right? Um, but I think, again, like one thing we see is that like, um, again, I'm not, I'm not trying to present it as good, but I do think with, with millennials, um, often we see that, um, you know, the sort of precarity, which is endemic, um, you know, as well as, uh, you know, relatedly their extensive engagement and I think cultural and, and educational sectors means that a lot of people aren't performing as much, uh, let's say, uh, repetitive, forcibly induced labor, uh, as generations in the past. And I think this would be the basis of the like <clears throat> the sort of charge that millennials are like lazy or like overly insistent oh, yeah, on self self-directing. Self yeah. But, but like we do, but not like on the on the line like boop tsh, tsh, necessarily. But not always. I mean like Ernesto, when you what do you in terms of what what are what are you what is your sort of uh, function within the factory system um in terms yeah. of put in terms of the output? Of the yeah yeah products sure I, I work in human resources so I'm oh, okay. a, yeah I'm a cognitarian right uh, yeah yeah I, I was thinking you always say factory and then I'm like therapist factory worker but you're you're an HR guy so that makes sense yeah yeah <laughs> it's a it's a very small factory we're 50 people and uh, I I've had to do uh, work on the on the line very often maybe like twice thrice a week a couple of hours oh really okay. Yeah, because usually uh, we're operating the, the machines with the buttons, you know, just go yeah. press the buttons in the machine. That's pretty uh -huh. much what I what I end up doing. And it's funny uh -huh. because uh, some production lines are very uh, are not very much alienated. Of course, they're alienated in the sense that the owner keeps the product of the labor. But, uh, for example, the workers will um, take the product from the moment it arrives at the warehouse to all of the different uh, times it goes through machines to the time it's shipped, right? That's some lines. And yeah. other, assemb or other of the assembly lines at, at work are much more alienated in that there's six workers in a line, one does something, moves the product along to the next one, and so on and so on. Yeah. And in my experience, I've, ha I've had uh, two specific uh, machine jobs in the past months. One is operating a, a CNC uh, a cutter, a computerized cutter. Oh, you, uh, you, you, offer, you do the machinist. You, you can do that. Yeah. yeah do you need a license to operate a CNC because in the States you do? Or you don't need it? You don't need Mexico. You don't need, yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I do. <laughs> Maybe I do there in the United are. States. <laughs> no, but it's, it's actually pretty cool because I program everything on the computer and then I just yeah. put it on a USB. Put it in a uh, put it in the USB slot. Press a button, and Boom. the machine does all the work. Yeah. 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 Interesting. I feel like a crippled monstrosity. <laughs> well, we're, oh, gonna be, we're gonna get into a lot of those metaphors, you know, in the next chapter, which is, I think, the biggest in capital. It's like, 
150 pages, the next chapter. Um, but, uh, or no, it's it's like 120, something like that. Oh. But I just wanted to say, I, I like this. Uh, this is really cute. The animals are complete oblivion. They are simultaneously non-class conscious, yet completely conscious, and they still attempt to reform their complete totality within the machine, uh, which I really enjoy, poetic touches. And tigers are the workers who have no contemplation of being workers. They have not encountered politics. Um, I think I want to add, I think it's it's interesting um, to think about that, like, because obviously, like, so for Marx, like, animals would function as constant capital, right? Um, and, you know, again, like, a lot of people will, will reduce that to the simple formulation that, oh, like, animals don't create value. And it's like, well, yes and no, because as we know, uh, constant capital is a requirement of value production, right? Like, if you're a zoo and you're having to compete, <laughs> okay, if you're a zoo and you're... If you're a zoo and you're having to compete with other zoos, you need like a certain investment, right? In constant capital, which in this case would be the animals, right? So they do actually participate, right? The, the point here though, the point here and the difference from Marx's standpoint would be the fact that, and I don't know if like, if zoo animals, for example, and their sale would be standardized enough that this would, this would be the case. But from a Marxist standpoint, um, once you have that generalization, those things are just being sold at their, you know, at their market value. And then you're not actually uh, producing surplus value as a consequence directly, right? As a consequence of having tigers, for example, right? Um, so it's a complex logic to kind of reconstruct. But I, I should be clear here: I don't want to, I don't want to criticize or devalorize. Well, I don't want to criticize or uh, you know present as undignified the work of tigers, uh, you know, <laughs> for people's amusement. Uh, they are they are crucial in doing that, right? Uh, should we talk about just to get back to work also? So, what do you guys? Th what do you think of work? You, like Elliot, you you said some critical things about work. Very pleasant. Uh, <laughs> it seemed very pleasant. She seemed very <laughs> pleasant. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I yeah I like I like the I like the writing. I find the writing interesting. Yeah, I think one of the other things that I that I write in the book is um, there are certain qualitative shifts which happen only with a logical error. So there's a problem with um in terms of like trying to further this is like further down but like the idea is like so I think if you start with the idea of like capitalism is over what's next you get different places that are kind of interesting even though the art that initial arguments like a little sh it's shaky I think it's technology fetishist but um in terms of like the new like you know super it I think it says it goes a little further than it actually does but um. Well, this is basically uh, yeah, this is basically like utopian like, like the speculative thinking of, of for sure. Well, I was surprised. I was really surprised to see Nick Cernichek giving an endorsement to to Works new Works new book, the post capitalist yeah. one. Um, why? Uh, why did Cernichek endorse it? Yeah, why, why, was why are you surprised that Cernichek endorsed it? Well, I was just surprised because Cernichek, like I've had com like I had a conversation with him and Mark Fisher in Poland in 2016, um, and I know. I know one thing that I thought was sort of a hallmark of Cernicek's thought was that he was quite insistent on the applicability of a of a more of, I'm not going to say more traditional, but like that you don't have to totally dispense with these Marxist categories in order to analyze present day society. And in fact, a more concrete application of them can be useful. So I don't know, like I, maybe I'm not doing justice because I feel like a lot of people have been responding more to like just kind of the the byline of Work's book than the book itself. But like the sense I got of it, I should say. Uh, was that, uh, I mean, it was sort of like, I think quite a predictable tendency to declare us to be in a state of like post-capitalism, um, which, you know, I mean, think of someone like Wark. He's not only in, you know, an economy in which, let's say, like, you know, traditional manufacturing has more and more been phased out, right? He's Australian, he lives in New York, but he's also in an academic sector where, mm -hmm. like I said, like, you know, it's not directly beholden to the reproduction of capital, right? So I think when you look at that kind of analysis, it's very easy to say that, like, you know, it seems to reflect very heavily one's own social position more than it does like a global mapping of how um, production or distribution functions, right? That'd be my, yeah. Uh, so that'd be my critique of that. Any, do you guys have any thoughts? I don't want to monopolize too much. I think it, it makes sense in terms of Cernicek's sort of broader, broader um, project within the, within the uh, vein of left accelerationism in terms of more forgiveness of these sort of initial um, definitional um, disputes, right? Where we see like, of course, the, the 
Marxists, traditional Marxists will go back and forth and like really hammer it out versus trying to get to that sort of like um, speculative place. So for, for that reason, I, I see it very much um, of like Sir Nietzsche's vein, right? Well, I think, and I think it's safe to say that a lot of these, um, like a lot of these things that are identified with like Prometheanism, Prometheanism or accelerationism, le like left accelerationism of the Sir, Sir Nietzsche Williams type are basically efforts to like recuperate these more speculative projects um, and to like scientize them. So, I mean, I think, yeah. you know, you can, if you look at the relationship between like Nick Land and Ray Brazier, right? Yeah. Um, you know, there's definitely, uh, you know, in terms of how they take up, um, you know, in terms of some of the, some of the, some of the way they appropriate Deleuze and so forth, though, I think Brazier shifted in more of a Hegelian direction. There are some similarities, um, but yeah, he wrote the, I mean, Brazier wrote the, the foreword for Fang Newman and he basically said just that. He said like, you know, these essays, uh, like have the tendency to like lapse into like a kind of uncomfortable like mysticism, for instance, or like romanticism. Um, but nevertheless, they're like there are there are worthwhile theoretical indications in these essays, right? Um, yeah, I remember it really disturbed me reading his Freud, reading his uh, Freud writing Nick Land. That sort of fucked me up for like a week. <laughs> what does he? What does he say? He sort of he sort of writes Freud as the pervert, right? In okay. terms of and then it does it, and it, he writes in the fucking weird script. Does it want a fucky wucky? And I was just like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I, was, I can't, man. I was like, that's fucked up, man. <laughs> and, and then, of course, thinking thinking of Freud and then his sort of transcendental um, qualities, I was just like, I like really, I sort of had to reread Freud again after that. You know, <laughs> yeah. We have a uh, we have one here. Wait. Uh... Would socialism be necessary if we remained in the manufacturing era? Uh, that's like a, again, Daniel Jacobs just torturing me with these great questions. This is like I exist to serve you, serve these questions, Daniel. Uh, but uh, I think my take on that, just very, very schematically, which I'll say very schematically, would be that um, it seems to me that the resolution of uh, the underconsumption, which would in turn be in, in a more orthodox reading, a consequence of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall uh, came about through like massive socialization. So the question would be examining how that massive socialization was manifested. Um, so for example, like in the Nazi context, uh, that was like toward military expenditure, right? Um, and Son Rethel actually, he has a, a text, the, the class structure of German, I think it's the class structure of German, German fascism or something like that. But he's really good on this, right? Because he worked for like a Nazi industrial newspaper. Yeah. Um, I feel like I don't know a lot about it because I feel like it's cursed every time. Like I, I wouldn't want to like look into it, but of course I need to get over that, right? <laughs> so yeah, go on. Sorry. You mean it's cursed? Why is it cursed? Well, I think workers, not the fascist workerism, um, and then it's sort of re-emergence. I yeah. hesitate. Yeah. Well, and well, actually we should talk about that in relation to coronavirus in a second because I read a great piece okay. on that. The jail men who were posted, but but I just want to say like with that, so there, like uh, Son Rethel has this breathless summary of uh, a speech by Hitler where he's talking to the military, uh, and Hitler he goes like a uh, uh, he goes he comes out and it wasn't clear what the position of the Nazis were on the official German military because they hadn't won over their support yet, right? They had their own uh, sort of like you know police like their own like kind of uh, thug police force and and so on, um, thug squad whatever, uh, but. Um, and that had to be that had to be disciplined right later on to fall in line with the general dictates of the state. But Hitler goes up and like he's addressing the military, right, military leaders. And they don't know uh, what, you know, they don't know what he's going to say or what direction he's going to go in. And he goes like he goes, the you know, the state has announced that there will be a raise of, you know, uh, five million Deutschmarks or something. I read the numbers. I don't remember for, yeah. for the German military. Right. And then he goes, this is unacceptable. Right. And then the military is like. And then he's like, there will be a rise of 30 million Twitch marks, right? For the German military, right? <laughs> what a fucking... <laughs> like that's... <laughs> what a sophist, though. You know, <laughs> you know, it was really funny that I saw in person what I saw. I saw I saw Moldbug, Mencius Moldbug in person read a FDR speech as if FDR was Hitler. And it was 
it shook me. But just like I, what you did reminded me of it as well, because you like did this very well. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like some, some people who do philosophy could really transition into that sort of role. <laughs> Thank you. Like Thank you, Elliot. Yeah, um, you can really <laughs> um, but yeah. I, I think... Plug. <laughs> so, I, but I think this is so. If we're gonna, but if we're gonna, so in Nazi Germany, it went toward military. Um, you know, I think if we're gonna look at, uh, if we're gonna look at the problem with that, uh, it would be on a purely economic level, notwithstanding any other problem. Uh, it would be that I mean, I think, and I think this is interesting. Like uh, Deleuze talks about like fascism as like a kind of suicidal vector, right? Mm -hmm. But I think the problem is that when you only have uh, there were other. I mean, it's a bit more nuanced. Son Rethel gets into how they, they reorganize the economy in different ways with respect to agriculture and so forth. But when so much of your economy is bound up in military investment, right, the problem is that you have to keep doing it, right? And like, you know, that disproportion uh, exists and it, you know, uh, has an effect, right, on the constant impulse to have war, right? Uh, yeah. So Nazi Germany, coming from a position where they didn't have the same wingspan in terms of military application as, say, the United States has today, uh, you know, we're pursuing these very, very aggressive actions. Um, and they were, you know, a lot of these military actions were actually having negative effects uh, on the ability uh, of uh, internet, like multinational German firms to actually conduct business, right? So I think, well, sure. <laughs> is it, is he at Siemens? I forget, like he, he's talking about a bank and he was talking about how like the, basically this multinational bank were getting really like pissed off and depressed as the Nazis got more and more powerful because like they realized that like their capacity to conduct international banking was being greatly blocked by all of the the prohibitions that were imposed on on Germany, right? Because of that. Um, but okay, but just to yeah. say, just to say, in America. Why, sorry, but, continue. Uh, but that's why capitalism is such a more efficient version of because you know the not, the fascist idea is war forever war, and they say forever war. That's not a very popular position. But then <laughs> capitalists sort of obscure, and then they do the forever war, and so the business interests are sort of kept in line. It's sort of like checks the tendency of fascism or imperial or we should say more accurately it, or, or non-rhetorically rather imperialism it checks it makes it more friendly to business right well part of part of part of when machiavelli talks about caesar borgia and why he failed to create an italian republic right part of what he discusses is like that uh the reason borgia is so uh hated right uh you know where he's considered this villain was because like basically uh the borgia family went too fast Right, that other families like took a long time to kind of uh, insinuate themselves into like you know the Italian political class and the papacy, whereas the Borgias tried to do it very quick. And I think you see the same thing with Nazi Germany, where uh, you know it's this sort of whiplash where they were trying to like just go like in quite a kind of a, quite an old school way trying to conquer the world. And yeah, you see much more cooperation, uh, you know, in those sort of liberal capitalist states uh, between the extensive expenditure on military as a means of like opening up and protecting like capital interests. Yeah. Um, but also the development of, for example, like a consumer economy, right? So I, I, as to the question about what I wanted to say, and in the Soviet Union, right, we see a balance, but that balance is more toward the creation of centralized public infrastructure and military than consumer economy, right? Yeah, and the Trumps, right? Yeah. How, how, what do you mean about, how, how, what do you mean about Trump? Would you elaborate? The Trump family, how they're insinuating themselves into as much as they can. Um, how they're insinuating themselves into oh into into the government, yeah, political structures. Okay, sure. yeah, yeah, you you'd see that. Um, and I don't have like an analysis off the top of my head. You'll be shocked to to know. Um, but we'll come back to that. We can come back to that in a minute. But I just meant that the question originally was um this one: Would socialism be necessary if we remained in the manufacturing era? And I think a more effective way of reformulating the question um would be because I consider the post-manufacturing thrust of Western societies to correspond with the rise of consumer markets um, and the use, for example, of technology within the context of consumer markets, right? Um, I think the more, like, and on a basic level, like, okay, you create government employment to uh, ameliorate some of the deleterious consequences of underconsumption to be very schematic. But I guess I think the better question would be, would socialism be necessary if the kind of uh, lateral investment that was pursued was not pursued to combat under consumption, qua the tendency, the rate of profit to fall, of which the post -man ostensibly post manufacturing era. I mean, are we in a are we in a post manufacturing era? Not no, I mean, no, like we're, we're like we said last time, in terms of Baudrillard's problem, which is like, oh, it's it's the signs world. It's like, well, you are in the signs world because you are in France, where manufacturing isn't happening, right? So, 
I think maybe I think it's split more now. Now people are isolated in their own um, sort of uh, technological sector. Uh, depend and uh, you know, I think Mao touched on it. And of course, Maoists uh, you know focus on third you know third world. Uh, but I mean, I think uh, you don't even need Mao to just sort of recognize right that different parts of the world take care of different uh, parts of sort of the global. Um, uh, manufacturing of the range of products we determine as essential product, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know what's so interesting about uh, the corona about coronavirus? <laughs> what? <laughs> See what I can say? Which is which is it's it's really brought up the question of essentialism in terms of into the absolute public right in their face. Um, in terms of what is essential and what is sort of non-essential. And I don't mm -hmm. think it's a coincidence that, you know, this might sound libertarian, but it's just, I think it's just obvious. I don't think it's a coincidence that the government imposes restrictions and then determines itself essential. <laughs> right? Um, there's something, there's something up there, uh, you know, and I, and that sort of made me more sympathetic to Sartre, which was, uh, you know, I'd hate to be an existent worker in the, in the time of essentialism, right? Because, <laughs> you know, everyone's trying to survive and it's like, oh, these people are essential and these people are essential. Baskin Robbins mascot, they're essential. Yeah. And of every little facet of our government is essential. Um, but you, you know, you who, you know, have a, have a clothing business, which you're like sort of, you know, clothes are not essential. Why are clothes not essential in like some fucking corner of a bureaucracy is essential, right? Mm -hmm. um so well it's also yeah i mean and part of it's just the fundamental sustenance of the economy right because like i think we we know very well like government tends to be like the last line of expenditure to try to stave off under consumption mm -hmm. right yeah um, yeah i, I think in the, we, you can see uh the parallel in different countries for example how brazil and mexico are handling the coronavirus coronavirus i'm sorry and uh how the united states is handling it because I understand that manufacturing hasn't uh, entirely left the United States. Uh, you guys do a lot of um, food farm. agriculture. Yeah, yeah, farming. yeah. yeah thank you. Um, but for example, here in Mexico, we do a lot of uh, handi handicraft, right? Uh, what we're talking about, uh, the whole chapter. And I still have to go to work to the factory because the factory does uh, pallets and the pallets uh, are sold to a local business who does um, motor drives, right? And the motor drives are essential for the uh, cooling equipment that, that you yeah. guys in America use to store medicine, right? So for example, here in Mexico, uh -huh. the only businesses that are open are, are handic handicraft businesses, uh, manufacturing, right? You go to the yeah. mall and the malls are closed. Um, most uh, restaurants are, uh, are shut. You can only uh, get uh, delivery services. Uh, but yeah. I'm seeing that in other countries, you, uh, they're even opening malls again because their economy is yeah. completely ground to a halt. Yeah, exactly. Well, and that, that, that actually, it's very indicative, I think, when you look at um, when you look at what gets suspended, right? Like, so like, you know, like a lot of the service sector immediately suspended, right? But like manufacturing mm -hmm. very often will remain relatively intact. Yeah. Um, also, also the fact that what immediately gets tabled is like the reduction of rent and mortgage payments Right. And I mean, if you go back to like classical political economy, it's like, you know, a lot of, you know, I mean, before the bourgeois sort of subsumed like the domain of property. Right. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and in England, this was a particularly egregious problem because they didn't have e.g. the French Revolution. Um, so mm -hmm. the, the remain major property owners um, like, you know, there was a, a very, very radical critique of uh, aristocratic structures of property ownership uh, that was pursued by bourgeois thinkers. Right. Um, and you actually see that. So it's not just like Marx, actually. It's funny because Marx doesn't focus on that as much because his focus is on, he does write yeah. about it. Like, there is Adam Smith value. do that. Yeah, actually, that's bigger in Adam Smith. That's Ricardo's like main thing. He just fucking hates. He's just like, stop, stop these assholes. Like they're just making. Yeah, they hate worse. landlords, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's kind of a thing. So I think it's it shows you how ancillary it is. to so like the overall functioning of the economy that like one of the first things that, that happens invariably uh, is that this gets brought up. Right. Mm hmm. I wanted to, what was it? And I wanted to say about, uh, oh, I wanted to say quickly about, just to get back a little bit to division of labor. Mm -hmm. um, oh, no, wait, okay. I want to say about Trump first. Trump, yes. 
you asked me about Trump. Here's my theory of Trump, which is sort of like comes from a lecture from Catherine Malibu. But okay, here's my theory of Trump. I think Catherine, Mal Catherine Malibu talks about like a, a, a civil war between like uh, traditional capital and like multinational digital capital. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that we're actually seeing that uh, in the United States, right? Um, sure. So I think that if you look at like banking capital and tech capital, like a lot of them are aligned with the Democrats. Uh, whereas I think if you look mm -hmm. at like, um, you know, banks that are purely national in operation um, or um, like coal, mining, coal mining companies, certain forms of manufacturing and so forth, they tend to align themselves with Trump. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that in a way he becomes like, you know, if you think of how he was always perceived as sort of like, you know, and it's interesting too, right? Because he he comes from the field of um, of landlordism, right? Which is not, you know, is not a productive field as such, right? Um, mm -hmm. And it's very localized, right? In terms of how it functions, right? Um, you know, it's, it's like, that's like, so that's the other thing, right? Like if you have a coal mining thing, that's like constant, that's fixed capital in that location, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, obviously property, you can't just, just get up and move, right? So it's just less susceptible to that kind of process. And I think Trump, you know, in the, he was perceived in the past as kind of like comic relief, but in no way comparable to someone like Steve Jobs in terms of his capitalist genius, if you will, right? Um, yeah. And I think that what this reflects is that he's kind of like spearheading this revolt by capitalists against capitalists. Um, mm. And what he what he's been successful of doing, and there was an article that was on right workerism, and what people were pointing out was that, um, like you know, the protests like which are partly astroturfed, I think, but the protests like one of the things you see is like the right, like the it's presented as like a right, like everyone should should be able to work, right? Everyone should be able to sell their labor power, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think like in a way like with no meaningful working class option, right? What happens is that like a lot of uh, the proletariat will gravitate, uh, you know, it's ultimately split, but a lot of them will gravitate toward the, the national capital option, right? Which, in a, in a, in a, I'm not saying it's it's right, but in a weird roundabout way, you can see the sort of logic, right? If you look at how like GM has been gutted because of job moving in Mexico and things like that, um, you know, it, that, it, that, that certain, like, I don't know exactly how the level of mediation at which this functions, but that certain members of the proletariat might throw in their lot, you know, which is, it's, I don't know, it's like, uh, peasants in revolutionary France supporting the Catholic Church rather than the bourgeois revolution. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's the answer. <laughs> but, but so Trump, Trump is kind of this laughed at and sort of marginal figure. Um, but, um, you know, and in a way he becomes part of the sort of economy of signification as well, because he gets away from like more organic uh, leasing and more toward just se selling his brand, slap it on hotels. So he's part of that shift as well and stock market and all that. But I think he becomes an avatar of like what's left behind, mm -hmm. right? Which is like national capital, um, you know? So he looks, he seems like he evinces this like, you know, sort of grotesqueness um, that I think is also like a uh, kind of caricature of like the old school national capitalist, right? And you yeah. asked about that a regression on capital? Uh, yeah, though one thing Malibu points out is that it functions kind of interestingly because Trump's, uh, this is the weird thing about it, Trump's like aversion to certain forms of international cooperation actually makes it harder to regulate certain multinationals. Um, so it can perversely have the effect of actually advantaging them at that level. Um, so it's it's a bit more ambivalent uh, in terms of its function. But yeah, there's a big, the people who vote for Trump are like, it, you know, and this is the thing, like he's getting enough of the people who are wealthy and more socially mobile that he's trying to win them over in different ways, right? I mean, I talked mm -hmm. to a guy on the airplane um, and he was, he did, he sold solar panels and mm -hmm. in the Bay Area, uh, and he was like, uh, he was like, man, he's like, if the poorest states in America want to give me like a two thousand dollar a year tax cut, like, you know, he's like, he's like, I didn't ask for it. He's like, but I'll take it. <laughs> like, <laughs> so he wasn't a big fan of Trump's policies, but he was pointing out that the irony of the fact that the poorest states voted for Trump, right, and the beneficiaries of those tax cuts are people who are actually living in New York, California, and so on, right. Um, well, that's what I said. As soon as I got like, as soon as I got the stimulus check, I said this should go to unemployment. I shouldn't be getting a, a check because I still have my job at full capacity, um, and it could go to people that have lost their job. They're like, give me my check. It's like that's not. Or give me. Oh, then give me your check. It's like that's not. You know, <laughs> one check isn't the difference. The difference is like how many people like me are um, getting getting a COVID COVID relief who don't need it, and how many people are sort of stuck with oh open everything back up and there's I, I have a lot of sympathy with people who've lost their jobs and they want um everything to open up because they're like look you know whatever whatever utilitarian idea you have in your head i can't make rent 
I'm going to get kicked out of my apartment. I'm going to get kicked out of my house. I'm going to lose my business or I'm going to lose my, um, for that from one person. I know one person. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's sort of, I, I have this sort of general idea that it's like, this is clearly, this has been done poorly. And in terms of Trump, in terms of why Trump the capitalist, not Bezos the capitalist, right? Um, you know, in so far as Biden exists and, um, and, you know, our government is this sort of not effective sort of spectacle based, uh, very in line with, you know, media and the government are sort of like very closely sort of what is going to be the line. Um, it makes sense that Trump being the spectacle capitalist, who's the scam artist, uh, more so than Bezos is just the pure, you could say just, you know, circuit, circuit repeater of capitalism, like, Trump is a little different in terms mm-hmm. of I don't think Bezos really relies on spectacle, whereas Trump is like man of the capitalist of spectacle, yeah. Um, and his sort of his sort of um, but I think you're right, Conrad. In terms of he is a sort of throwback. He's like the '80s mascot, no? Uh, <laughs> in, you know, national capital. He's he's of course he's, he does, he's not a, he's not a genius in terms of. Um, in terms of like contemporary capitalism or making money in this extraordinary sort of way, right? He does these sort of basic scams, really. No, I mean his, his 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 genius, if he has any, is in um, is in like transforming himself into a brand, which is more characteristic of like postmodern capitalism. Um, but but yeah. there's a certain misinterpretation of Trump. Like he likes to present himself as like a self-made man, whereas in actuality he was like a rich kid who shifted the focus from, um, you know, these more uh, traditional uh, forms of capital accumulation um, to essentially the transformation of his name into something that could be um, uh, monetized in a more significatory or broader way, right? So again, I I don't mean to say that he's only been, but I'm saying he has a a heritage in in these more traditional sectors um, that uh, that makes him, I think, more sensitive to those concerns. And you look at like Vince McMahon from like WWE being like Uh one of his... You know, and it's like you couldn't think of a more provincial manifestation than like WWE, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's like you know very popular in the South, obviously. Um, so I think they it's popular um, in South in, in, in South LA. Everybody, like, I don't know it, but everybody knows. Everybody knows like the intricacies of WWE and WWF. What's what's the Might demographic? Of South LA? Area. What? What's the demographic of South LA? Uh, Hispanic and African American. Okay. Yeah. So that would, that would, that would reinforce what I'm saying, right. About like the, the provinciality of it as like a, as a manifestation. Um, and I don't mean provinciality in some like, well, maybe it's, I'm not saying everything those people like is necessarily worse. That's not my point. Right. Um, but I'm saying they're less connected in certain, in many ways to the circuits of global capital and social mobility. Right. Mm-hmm. Like the NFL is like a comparatively large and cosmopolitan league. Right. And I'm not like, of course you still see like all kinds of like patriarchal uh, outbreaks in the NFL, like with Colin Kaepernick, but you also see like uh, uh, a internal lobbying within the NFL to try to like appeal to international markets and maintain this image of like political co- politically correct benevol- benevolence uh, and so forth, which is why the, the Ka- Kaepernick thing was so harmful, right, for the NFL's image and obviously because of the importance of black fans and viewers as well, right? Yeah. Um, I I just wanted if we could we take up this quick. Uh, would not a socialist party have to meet both the demands of the protesters demanding work and the essential workers demanding better working conditions? Uh, yeah, I guess my point here would be that, like, you know, in an age of the capitalist reality principle, like, it's very predictable that this becomes conceptualized as a feud between, um, you know, the right who wants to, like, re- like restore order so that people, well, capitalist order, so that people can uh, make enough money to live and the left that's unable to offer them like, you know, adequate compensation for what would, you know, that would be needed uh, to actually facilitate a more successful uh, confinement, right? Um, so, you know, I mean, obviously there's a place for like a, a true left position there, which is addressing those those economic concerns while simultaneously acknowledging um, the depths of the problem. But I'm saying you can see how right workerism becomes the thing, right? Um, yeah. You know, be, because of the way that like, you know, the appeal to national capital uh, industries uh, and the conceptualization of like that kind of work as the only way in which one can survive, right? Uh, as opposed to, you know, for example, a substantial enlargement of the public sector um, as that it emerges sort of on that basis. 
Yeah, you'd be surprised. Uh, at the factory, a lot of my coworkers are conservatives. And we have a left-wing president right now. And most of the things they say is that things should be going to the people who work, not to the impoverished communities in the South. Yeah, well, well that's into, like yeah. Terreno and Norteño, and like in terms of that oh, yeah. split, yeah. Oh yeah, and yeah, we're the capital of the Norteño yeah. business. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, in Italy, sense. the in Italy, the um, um, what like one of the I'm trying to remember is it which which party is Salvini part of? And I hear a lot about Italy because of because uh, mm -hmm. of Ludovica party of Salvini, and it's uh, uh, Mario Salvini. The Northern League, yeah. So in Italy, this is interesting, right? Because like uh, the the collapse, like and you know the the Italian Communist Party obviously uh, had like a huge impact on shaping the culture, uh, you know, especially in like the 1960 to 1980 era, in which there was like a lot of really interesting, you know, radical thought uh, in that period, right? From Tronti to Federici to Fortini, right? We go on and on. Um, but then there was like a, a fairly spectacular collapse. Right of the Italian Communist Party, and it's interesting. One of the result of this is that, like, if you look at the Northern League, a big part of their position, the North is is more industrial, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It's the seat of industry uh, and development, like, but you know, uh, you know, traditionally, right? Um, and um, if you look at the position, like, it is kind of this more provincial position, right? Where it's like, well, we make the money, right? We should be the ones in charge, yeah. right? So you see, and you see the way that you can yoke, again, absent a left-wing alternative, like factory workers used to support like the Italian Communist Party, it was enormous, right? Mm -hmm. um, but absent that that broad egalitarian program, right, that purports to ground a, a theory of political universalization, especially in, uh, you know, in the, uh, the manufacturing culture, right? Um, absent that, that ambition, right, you can see how there's kind of a scaling back uh, there's a scaling back and it's just like, let's just protect national capital and fuck the other side. Yeah. Right? Well, it's interesting you know, looking at this. It's not surprising that the workers are conservative. I agree with, uh, with Ender Wigan. I wonder who Ender Wigan is. I love that it's Ender Wigan, but, <laughs> but, um, yeah, cause I, I've read all the Enders, all the different ones. <laughs> and, uh, but no, but I think it's true in terms of, it's not surprising. Yeah. Thank you, Connor. That workers, workers are <laughs> because you know, once you have a job, you're under the illusion it's like well i did it all by myself i'm working i'm doing it right but if you can't get the job or you don't have access or you're you're uh you don't have um the link to that upload of this uh you know to be this determinant end of a specific machine that gets you money um so so uh yeah it does make sense that workers are can be conservative because um it's the sort of false you know, not looking at yourself as part of a system, but only looking at your labor time that you're doing. Just like, uh, you know, I think there's also the tendency towards like bodybuilding in um, uh, in conservative circles. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of like, you see a lot of like very right wing people that are also into like bodybuilding. And it's like, you see it permeating <laughs> throughout the, throughout the culture. And it's yeah. like, uh, as you are lifting things, it's like, I am lifting the thing, ergo individual effort ergo conservatism right that's sort of like the train of thought um so in that way i don't think it's surprising that people that are doing work um tend towards conservatism but mm -hmm. it is but you know you identify it it's like um what kind of society uh, makes the best society um that's sort of a different uh question right and well, then I, yeah sorry Hagel Hagel says that um like when something reaches a point of self-awareness, it's already in decline. And it's it's actually interesting because I heard a story about, you know, Bruce Springsteen, um, and he talked about kind of his efforts to clarify that he wasn't like pro Reagan, uh, you know, because he had the album, right, Born in the USA, which obviously was like, you know, a, a, a rallying cry against a lot of the forms of, you know, social repression experienced in America. Um, but, you know, it, had, it was emblazoned with, ironically, with an American flag on the cover. Uh, mm -hmm. And he, he'd become really muscular in this time. And then Reagan used part of the song Right, born in the USA for one of his his campaign uh, campaign advertisements, which got him like a season to assist. But the point is here, I would argue that like it's interesting that like beefcake cinema emerges in the eighties. Uh, you know, and you have this like you know like the whole standards of how a male body would appear change. Uh, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone and so on. And I would argue that like in a way that's like uh, the like that's like a self awareness 
like as it's as it's leaving America, right? Um, that the idea of like industrially defined masculinity, right, um, kind of becomes like a tropic genre in of itself, right? Yeah. But you know, see, so yeah, I think Rambo, right? That was like that was the thing, right? Industrial it was like decline masculinity. I yeah, have been Rambo, feeling that Rambo, only. Rambo, Reagan, Springsteen, right? <laughs> I, I think, you know, Ender also asked a while ago, is it making people regress? Uh, is, is the corona making people regress? And in terms of like, um, I know I feel like um, you, you sort so of rely on the source. Regression. I think he says, I mean, aggression in a psychological way. Mm -hmm. But he was like talking when about you go back like Trump as a regression of capital. No? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so but then he there's clarified the past to a prior form of capital, right? Yeah. And then there's so I think he's changing registers, which that Doug okay. would critique endlessly, of course. Um, <laughs> and um, a regression in a psychological way, but yeah, you I think you regress to uh, to um, not necessarily to your past, but maybe to a symbolic past or a symbolic sort of trope. I think um, when when an event happens, you sort of you know, the, the potential opens up as an excuse to sort of radically shift something. And I know I was, I was, I was feeling it. I feel like, I feel like, um, like Street Fighter exists now almost like, <laughs> like I was just like, like I have a whole get up where I'm like outside. It's like, I just felt like very 1980s and it's like, okay. here we go. Just, the jouissance of, um, of regressing toward or embodying some like sort of alien form or a past comforting form. Um, which which the video game Street Fighter which the video game Street Fighter already represents in a clear sense because anything Japanese about martial arts is like would already contain a certain nostalgia which would be parallel to like the American workers yeah. nostalgia like mm. so one of the gu guile in that is like a U.S. soldier he's like yeah, a U.S. Yeah. soldier who's really muscular right and it's almost like a kind of vintage World War II setting um, yeah. so you see that in both yeah. cultural registers you have like Japanese worker like re like nostalgic workerism conceptualized. Our American nostalgic workerism conceptualized through a Japanese frame, which for them is like actually not workerism because that happened later. It's actually like pre-industrial martial arts, right? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Well, America doesn't have like, um, in terms of within its register of the mean sort of governmental body, um, it doesn't have that sort of 3,000 year governmental history that I think a lot of most countries have. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like you go to England, it has a 3,000 sort of, you can, well, not three, actually it's more like 2,000, but, um, but you know, you go to various um, states. So you get, you get all these sorts of forms of, I think when we, when we reach for nostalgia, we, we don't we can't necessarily reach back into like an ancient form of martial arts. We have to reach back into like the repetition of spectacles of the past or something. Basically like that. primitive, primitive accumulation, right? If you look like Wild West. Films, but and yeah, then even oh, yeah. the, there you go. If you, mm. Even if you look at like um, if you look at like Gladiator or something like that. I mean, Frederick Jameson says no, no historical like every historical film is about the present, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think if you look at what something like Gladiator is really about, it's like you know, kind of examining because he's like the strong man who does things, whereas the other guy's this sort of effect, you know, uh, cunning emperor, right? Um, and I think uh, who's conspicuously feminine, which is another real trope of Western narratives. Um, but I think um, if you look at that, it's like, you know, it's, it's portraying, right, the supplanting of this, like, you know, uh, kind of like uh, physically robust worker class, right, uh, by, you know, these sort of conniving, right, you know, bureaucrats or, or cognitariat or whatever. That's kind of how I interpret that, mm -hmm. right? Um, which is actually even in Troy, right? If you watch Troy, which is the last epic, because it's supposedly, you know, it's like a secular interpretation of Troy that is is like... Uh, worker is not Marxist, I would say, in the sense that it, it stresses a lot like the the way that war is executed for national ends and has deleterious effects uh, on uh, the working class, right? But by secularizing the analysis, that actually, like taking away the gods, because gods aren't in Troy, right? It actually mm -hmm. becomes an even clearer uh, parallel to a kind of demi-Marxist analysis, right? So I think a lot of these ancient films, right? Like, you know, the ancient, and like, if they're American, like the ancient is just conceptualized, conceptualized through the prism of like industry. It's like, um, so I thought, I just want to say this is, so this is, this would be funny, right? Someone said, 
what is it? Uh, who said this? I thought that, I just want to highlight this for a second. I think this is really funny because I assume he's not talking about Ernesto. Um, so, but actually, this is quite because because Elliot is blonde, but but he we can both say I don't it's know. Really you. Um, although you know what you're talking about, I, I think both of us we combine into one white guy because I don't I don't you know I don't know what I'm talking about and you talk too much. So between the both of us, we talk too we're much the hybrid. <laughs> The one, like the specular white guy. But okay, you're, you're, but this is, this is something because, because you're Jewish, right? So you, like in some yeah. way, people, you know, that's more ambiguous with respect to white, but you're also blonde. I think so it makes, I, it, makes well, it really hard. I'm in, Los, I'm in Los Angeles. So I think maybe in other places, if I was like Eastern Europe, it would be because, you know, people would be like, well, you're Jewish, right? You're not white. You're not, right? Uh, versus yeah. like, um, versus here, it's like you're fucking white dude. <laughs> Right, so it depends on where you are, certainly. Yeah, and LA is one of the highest Jewish populations in the world, right? I I believe so. It, it was a, initially, um, you know, my my family was here very sort of early. Oh, really? Um, yeah, like uh, like the dirt roads. Uh, great great uncles were in the Jewish mafia. <laughs> okay. We, we had a Jewish mafia. There was like a. Surely, yeah. yeah. The story, the story is they would drop my grandfather, who was like the youngest one, off at a brothel, uh -huh. and they would feed him dinner while they, while the, uh, while the brothers would go out and do whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, there was also a time where my great uncle was in the. See, this didn't add up to me. I think I like blew his cover like hundred years later because he's like, "Well, I would have got shot, but I was in the bathroom," and then I was like. Well, if you were in the bathroom, how'd you go to go in the fucking bathroom? Like, <laughs> that's my question. Like, like that's that's a little fishy, but that's speculative, speculative. But no, LA is LA has a very had a, a big Jewish community. Uh, Boyle Heights, um, which is now a Hispanic community mostly, mm -hmm. um, but you still see it used to be Brooklyn Avenue. Now it's uh, Cesar Chavez Avenue. Uh, right. And Jews are sort of congregating in the Fairfax area, so so there is this sort of um, interesting shift in terms of like the Jew the Jewishness of Los Angeles. You go to New York, it's like are you like the it's totally different um, in terms of like I'm, I don't remember going there. And it's like wow, so many Jews, so many of the hats. <laughs> <laughs> Brooklyn, yeah, they have the big Orthodox. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, it's interesting. No, but that's well known about the, the mob thing. I mean, Bugsy Siegel, obviously. Um, yeah. Like, and in and, and Godfather too, right? Hyman Roth is portrayed as Jewish in that. And actually, it's kind of a caricature of like, you know, conniving Judaism uh, in that uh, in that film. Um, but it's a good performance. Um, but yeah, so the thing about, you know, it, that makes sense, right? Because there was like a Jewish working class that were, uh, you know, quite marginalized and dispossessed, um, you know, when a lot of, because you have that period prior to 1924, right? when they changed the laws, when you had just a ton of people coming through Europe and a lot of them had nothing, right? And then in that time, there was even more, you know, much more anti-Semitism than today. So it was, um, you know, you had a lot of Jewish mafia formations, right? Um, yeah, what, year, they, what year are you talking about? Are you talking about like the 30s or what are you talking like about? Like 1910, my grandfather was okay. born in 1910. He's passed away. He used to like, here we have the La Brea Tar Pits, which are like a big yeah. museum now. In his day, he used to walk over, there were planks and you could fall into the tar pits. <laughs> So that's kind of fun fact, fun early Los Angeles fact. If you want to see, um, see some, if you want to see, if you want a good game on old school Los Angeles, check out LA Noir, which is set in the fifties, which is cool. Yeah, I've I've played it actually. You know yeah. what? I, I need to upload his uh, memoir because he wrote a memoir before he passed away, and it has a lot of like original stuff you wouldn't find anywhere. Um, because he's like nineteen tens, nineteen twenties Los Angeles from like a very specific kind of point of view. It's kind of interesting. I need to I need to I need to upload it. Or okay. but we should we should move a little bit i just want to say about i just want to go back to division of labor quickly and what i want to say i'm fa find that fascinating but i just want to get back to division of labor uh what yeah, i yeah. want to say is so i think one of the most productive readings of um the division of labor uh is in son rethel's intellectual and manual labor uh and that's actually really interesting because son rethel uh he conceptualizes um kantian epistemology uh, as emerging, I might have explained this before, as emerging due to the value form, right? Uh, so for him, causality reflects a, a commodity exchange, for example, in which you have like an abstract transmission of products that is abstracted. It doesn't just happen in material reality. Um, time and space, right? The spatial temporal aesthetic, 
right? Uh, he traces the history of how like numerical conceptions and so forth are developed and how it relates to trade. Um, but I think uh, one of the things about this is that he doesn't actually deduce um, epistemology directly from uh, Kantian epistemology and really epistemology more generally, directly from the value form. He deduces it from the division of labor between uh, head and hand or intellectual and manual labor, right? Um, and this is actually discussed, right? He talks about the ancient, but he, talk, he, dis he discusses how this insinuates itself in the context of ancient society and how um, for the ancient Egyptians, they had like priests and ideologues, but uh, like they would use ropes to measure things and they kind of developed like ways of measuring lots. Um, but how in ancient Greece, this acquired, like there was a notion of like the independence of science from reality. Um, and you can see this in like Plato's forms and everything. And he attributes, the, he relates this to the money form, the way that like the money form is like, it's it's abstract, like, but it's also part of reality, mm -hmm. right? But then that, that, that relates to the way, like math and science, right? It's like, well, these are truths that are outside of any kind of, you know, they stand independently of the domain in which they're demonstrated, right? Um, so I think that's a really interesting thing to think about uh, is how, and so I think, I think now like we have this idea, like, you know, like, okay, we we're talking about Ernesto. We were talking about our respective fields, right? This notion that like what you do, oh, that's like a particular economic input, right? But what I do deals with the, the totality, right? Like, um, which, you know, you see in Hegel, right? An endorsement of that. But like, I think the point is that a really secular Marxist reading of that would be like, yes, what I do does pertain to the totality, but that totality is only like a totality of the capitalist mode of production or the value form that is in turn like ideologized via philosophy. So that it's not, it's not a real totality in the ontological, like in an ontological sense, mm -hmm. right? It's like an ideological reflection of actual uh, totalities of social production. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, you guys have any thoughts on that or? Hmm. I mean, well, it's just, sense. I think. Go ahead, no, I, I think it, it just goes back to the necessity of of not sort of taking the signifier as the basic thing or, or doing an ontological reading or an analytic reading of uh, trying to trying to stagnatize Marx or something like that within like a image or a picture or something like that. Um, we have a question. Anyway. Ernesto? Yeah. Uh, we have, uh, that I think I'm fine <laughs> with comments. We have a question by a guy called Skate Fast Read Marx. I don't know if you guys can put it on screen. Yeah, what is it? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. Boom. What, do think, oh, time, yeah. what do you think about chapter 14? It's uh, way up top. Uh, like two, oh, three, that's right. Uh, the, the, what yeah, do you think of in regards, uh, what do you think about chapter 14 in regards to the shaping of time? Because the control of time is extremely important for that topic. Or, also can be used in the workers' benefit. I, I'm not sure how it can be used in the workers' benefit uh, because from what we read in the chapter, uh, this uh, division of labor makes people's jobs uh, simpler over time. It, it reduces, it removes the gaps between their uh, one moment of work and another. And they also said something about overtime, with, uh, with, which I would also like to know uh, what they mean because I don't know uh, what your experience is in the United States and elsewhere, but here in Mexico, salaries are calculated, let's say, in a way that you have to work over time. Yeah, right? that happens with um, certain jobs where they have like, for instance, in the airports, they're all overtime jobs where you, where people work six hour, six days a week, 10, or 10 to 12 hours a day. Mm -hmm. um, and that's calculated within it. And you get a lot of um, people that are quote unquote unskilled laborers, but are trying to like sustain a family working those jobs. Uh, right. I thought that was a, a funny. That's a really funny. Like, I thought that was a really funny. Like, narrow question about overtime because, like, I think we just said that like time itself as a concept probably comes from like systems of exchange. Um, so this is a very you're going to blow this question up, right? Time is like mm -hmm. a big thing in capital, right? And the, and the mm -hmm. temporal reading now is really popular, um, which is related to the value form reading, right? Because if if the value form is correlated, I hesitate to say directly directly connected or reflective of, but correlated uh, with labor time, right? You know, it, where, where the law of value is instantiated, then the battle actually becomes about time, right? And the structuration of time, right? Which is, gets really, really important. So yeah, you could use it to get the, stop the boss from making you work overtime, but then you should be aware when you do that, that you're only wielding 
uh, the temporal mechanisms that have been created uh, by historical forms of capital leading into the present um, while you're doing it. But that doesn't mean you can't do it, right? Uh, I do my Jordan Peterson note, but that doesn't mean you can't do it, right? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but I, and this actually raises an interesting question for me, which is like, because originally what I thought he was trying to ask was that like, in a communist society, would you have like this sort of like time-based accounting of labor, right? Um, and I mean, if abstract labor is, as Marx suggests, just like the quantification of labor, then it seems to me that there's some kind of utility for it. But I also would, I also don't know if like, because it seems to me that its quantification is contingent upon de-skilling, right? Yeah. Like, so if you have machines doing everything that's like de-skilled, right? As with your fragment of machines, kind of Negrius reading, um, Cernicekian reading, um, then, uh, then like it's the other forms of the forms of labor that would continue to exist would resist that kind of easy quantification. Right? Yeah. Well, like being, being a therapist or more specifically, how about being a computer programmer, right? Mm -hmm. um, programming machines, fixing machines. So those would maintain their skilled uh, tier, of course. Not, that, that's sort of the, the right, the accelerationist or unconditional accelerationist is ideas that eventually technology will increase and the computer programmers will sort of figure out, I don't know how true this is. I think it's a very non super sensible realm idea, which is uh, eventually the computer programmers will realize that they don't need the rest of us, which I think is like, you know, that more of the tendency of the right to fetishize the like single person who has the skill, because of course mm -hmm. they need somebody to sell it to, right? <laughs> if you're gonna, or they need somebody to produce the technology for, they're not simply just going to produce technology and then the technology itself will create this sort of abstract, you know, or not, I shouldn't say abstract value because we're here, <laughs> we're in a capital group. So produce something for them. Well, yeah, and the tech, the tech, the tech ideology, as I understand it, is basically like a kind of like, um, it's a kind of like futurist, it's a, it's a combination of two things. And I think one is like, uh, the uh, kind of like capitalist ideology of you can do it yourself, mm -hmm. which is, you know, arising from the fact that, again, there were new domains of accumulation and there was like a unique opportunity for people who are, let's say, educated to do that in that time period, right? Which though that's less and less the case, right? As it becomes more and more subsumed. Um, so a combination of this, like you can do it yourself with this like futurism, right? Because like the, you know, it, I, I would argue it, it probably is this way enough historically, but like in this particular case, especially like the, you can do it yourself uh, was expressed in this kind of future, somewhat futuristic way. Where it always runs into trouble, this whole, this whole California ideology is like just in actually addressing like the fact that like, you know, computers are a military technology and they were created through public funding and 85% of the parts in an iPhone like come from well, yeah. US military mm -hmm. investment, right? Well, when you think of the the uh, decentralization of manufacturing, California ideology can function very nicely within California with the mechanisms of global capitalism because you can simply, to some extent, ignore, you know, you can ignore it like in a very sort of just very actual reality sense. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easy to ignore. But of course, it's not really libertarian, uh, you know, technology, uh, Ideology functions within the sort of state apparatuses of, uh, of sort of what we value, which is spectacle and technology and convenience and doing whatever you want, right? <laughs> That's very California, which is the do it, the do whatever you want geist in California is very strong. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's in, uh, sorry. Continue. Yeah. Well, California is the place where. You know, even um, historically, musicians come, actors come. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's basically sunny. It's like, a, you know, the idea is it's a sort of the vacation spot. It's, um, I like to, I like to think of it, or I've written on Cal or Los Angeles. Well, this is more Los Angeles. It's sort of the spectacle. It's like the anus of America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's maybe, maybe it's the mouth. It's, maybe it's, or we could be Deleuze. It's both the mouth and the anus yeah. of America. It's, it's the cloate. No. <laughs> doesn't quite work, um, but in terms of it produces the spectacle, but it doesn't immediately associate it with it. Where if you go to like DC, mm -hmm. um, oh my God, it's a totally different spectacle. But then there's an immediate uh, actuality that people sort of take on, and you get this sort of stiff, stiff DC look, which is like this. 
and it's just very different than anywhere else in the East Coast, even. Um, so it's like a very, uh, I think California is the place which is sort of radically the structural irony of, um, which I also write in the book so that all, anyway, <laughs> the structural, the, no, but the idea is that all structure contains, because it contains alienation from itself, all structure or order is ironical in this sort of sense. And you can either embody it like Trump or you can double down on its non-irony. Uh, and I think DC is that space that doubles down on its sort of non-irony and then California is the one that doubles down on the ironical detachment from the spectacle while still enjoying, you know, the um, uh, capital process. Well, at least the, some do. <laughs> uh, well, what, they, the what, they, what, they, what they share in common though is that in spite of the cultural differences between like, let's say government work and um, these sort of, uh, you know, entertainment sector, tech sector uh, things, is that um, like I think that um, they both uh, they both share in common that there's a kind of like you know gilded upper crust, right? And it's probably more more elite, especially in the, in the LA entertainment context. Though I realize the economy is more diversified than that. But what I mean is like you know so like this has become more and more because government jobs used to be comparatively accessible, but as like you know we've seen. Uh, the consequences of neoliberalization in terms of the replacement of the manufacturing by low-wage service jobs, government work, and more people being educated, more and more people are trying to go into government as a respite from those broader trends. And, you know, now it's like practically like winning the lottery to get like any, a lot of these jobs. Um, well, yeah, so well, it's, yeah. The government, the government has that quality of like, it's gilded. And then in California, fame has that quality. And, you know, fame has a material consequence in terms of you know one person who's like world famous, and there's a lot of them in LA, um, mm -hmm. and it has a sort of effect, or it has because there there's an ability to sort of they're sort of um, given this access to an ability to make more sort of to generate more capital. Like for instance, I have a, I have a fun story. You want to hear a Backstreet Boys story? Sure. <laughs> so, so I I know somebody who knows somebody. Anyway, point mm -hmm. being. They uh, they they like they know AJ from the Backstreet Boys. That's the Backstreet Boys boy that they know, right? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, if he his idea is he can um, when he wants something, he has, like there's like a, like a new piece of technology that's worth like fifteen thousand dollars. It's fairly easy for them to get it for nothing. Sure. Um. Right. And then, yeah. of course, that creates a whole sort of system around them. And then it creates a whole sort of um, system around the entertainment industry. And then, you know, I get I get clients who want to be in that entertainment industry that are, you know, proletariat, you know, South L.A. And it's sort of like you can you can sort of see the whole you can see the whole thing. It's very trippy um, in, in sort of the effects of um, how fame is not just spectacle, but material. Um, Within to give you, sort of to give to give you an idea of how that plays out differently for for uh, you know passe Canadian pop stars, I understand that in Toronto you had the band the Moffats. They were like uh, a popular um, boy band like in the '90s. And one of the guys he works at a shoe store in uh, the Bay in downtown Toronto, and he'll go like yeah. regale, you, regale you with stories about his heyday if you buy him a New York fries. Um, so it's not a fifteen thousand dollar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, different spectacle levels. Yeah, but I just want to say, so for a moment, like, yeah, entertainment industry gilded uh, and, and very unionized, actually, which I actually just learned during Zero Plateaus the other day. Um, yeah. And um, uh, Washington, right, gilded, especially because of, like, the increased demand for those jobs due to other economic trends. But I think, I guess what I'm saying, I think for a moment, tech was not, right? Um, and I think that that had really, really extensive ideological effects. But, like, in terms of what you're saying about this, I think it's interesting how this changes. So... Now, more and more, of course, we're seeing this kind of lock hold and stranglehold on Silicon Valley by uh, a few companies, Facebook, Google, Apple, and so forth. Um, and I think what we're also seeing is that the, the sheer inflation and the cost of living um, comp combined with like the, the very high literacy of that region um, is encouraging a lot of, uh, you know, left wing activity and groups and theorizing and things like that uh, strongly in the Bay Area um, because of the loss of that. Uh, you know, the sense of loss of that opening uh, and also just the pressures that's imposing economically on everybody else, right? Because of the money from the tech industry being disproportionately uh, expended in that area, right? Um, so I know, I, I, you know, you can talk about like, um, 
I think uh, like Commune magazine um, and some of the stuff with Tikkun and stuff like that. But I think there's quite a bit going on in in the Bay Area in terms of uh, left wing left wing stuff. I don't know your, your sense of it, Elliot. But yeah, well, I always the Bay Area is almost nauseating for me because. I feel like LA is like so ironical and detached. And then you go to the Bay area and everything is actual. And it's like, Oh <laughs> fuck. It's like, it's a big shift. Cause I went to school in Santa Cruz, um, UC Santa Cruz, and that's sort of more Bay area people than mm -hmm. Southern California people. You know, I call it Northern California, but people from Northern California refuse to call it Northern California. Um, they're like central California, but to me it's Northern California. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the the you the to acknowledge that geography is a cultural construct. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. Um, but but the way that things are approached in terms of they have very similar to the DC Geist, a uh, sense of actuality mm -hmm. at hand. They're like um, contending with the issues. So it's a lot of uh, a lot of people I know who I did sort of like activist activist work or whatever in college who are still doing it like very much involved with one i think they're slowly you know slowly you know with the advent of bernie um they're slowly moving i would say no longer like radlibism you could say it's not even radlibism just sort of activist activist mentality um mm -hmm. into more sort of socialist spheres but you see the you see it's sort of a it's a cultural and this it's a sort of necessity to actualize these sort of of prefabricated um uh you could say democratic narratives, right? Um, it's almost, it's very difficult to get outside of it because there's such a force that you don't feel in LA um, behind it. Well, I think you can see the difference between like basically government, obviously, but basically like if you look at what uh, what uh, Northern it's California Anderson says, okay. <laughs> <laughs> If you look at what what Northern California does, right, the economy there, insofar as it's tech, uh, is basically based on like patterning capitalist logistics on pre-existing technology, right. So when you talk about the pretend, like the the kind of reality principle of that, uh, I think that uh, that's very very palpable, right. Whereas like if you look at a place like L.A., mm -hmm. um, you know, its culture is so so bound up um, with I hesitate to say the frivolity, but like the, the the culture of like you know the entertainment industry for example it's culture and economy and even more it's culture I think um, that uh, that's going to manifest in a slightly different set of uh, cultural priorities and it's interesting it's a way of analyzing a show like um, uh, like uh, Californication I mean Jameson in um, in postmodernism or the cultural logic of like capitalism he talks about how like postmodernism is the experience where you lose any reference point through which you can like observe capitalist assumption. Um, so like, you know, nature, the unconscious. And I take, uh, I take Californication as being about the alienation of someone who comes from like a New York that's still like enough in like, um, and in his time was enough in like a manufacturing mode of production that you had these alternative enclaves that could be conceptualized like art, you know, real art, right? Literature, you know, like, yeah. um, and his failure to situate, find that in LA and then his like collapse. Uh, it's terrifying going the other way too, going to New York and everyone knows what I'm talking about. I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> that must be scary. That must be scary. I have an advantage because nobody here, like people who don't speak English well. So like they all know what I'm talking about, but I can't communicate with them that well. Uh, but yeah, like if I went to a place, <laughs> Ernesto, but if I went to a place where they could all under, like I'm sure for Paris would have been traumatizing in a different way. Uh, if I had actually been able to engage with people as well as I engage with them in English, because I'd be like, oh mm -hmm. shit, I'm not that good. But you know, now I'm able to preserve this illusion. Like, oh, I'm great. Because um, the English world is so like tremendously, you know, undeveloped in terms of like, you know, Marxist thought. And and I, I try to tell this to like Matt and Ben sometimes, you know, and, and they're like, oh, no, no, it's good. And it's like, you know, like, it's not good. Like, <laughs> it's not good. Like, it's a lot better now than it was in the past, right? Like because of internationalization and increased ed like you know increased educational levels and all kinds of things uh, post recession radicalization or whatever. But I mean, like it's like you know you like for me like if you look at Italy again from 1960 to 1980 and and the population that it had and the kind of like left wing culture and and philosophy. I mean, it makes like any like per capita, and we have to say per capita because it's such a different population mass. It makes the like the Anglosphere look like a fucking joke. Right? Like, mm -hmm. um, we got we got Nathan J. Robinson. 
<laughs> current affairs, right? Um, that's what we got. Our uh, our brilliant savior here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, should we try well, to look at the comments I, before? Surprising in terms of um, both people. Oh no, I shouldn't say this actually. What were you gonna say? Fact, I won't say it. No, no, no. Okay, don't say, say it. Say <laughs> I would say people interested in my work or my services mm -hmm. come from the francophone regions. And it's in the, you know, even, even um, people that are like working class, um, you know, both, both, you know, Americas and Europe, they know, they have a sense, they know who Hegel is, they know who Lacan is, um, yeah. which is, yeah. So they're like, it's a totally different thing. Like you're not even, it's not even in the same ballpark. Like the idea of the, of the cat, like capitalist spectacle is so the prevailing geist, especially for me here in like LA um, versus like people that are engaging with these uh, discourses throughout time. You know, it's incomparable mm -hmm. really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the big problem faced by the big problem faced by the, the, like the French working class is functioning at a whole different level of theoretical literacy. Um, and really, all of France exists in like the shadow of the Pace AF, like Italy is in kind of in the shadow of the Pace E. Um, but um, yeah, like the um, the real the real problem is like you know uh, the reconstitution of those struggles in like a dramatically changed economic and social landscape. Um, you know, and and overturning kind of you know the ideology of post sixty eight capitalism, which has some some salient parallels with California ideology in general. Um, but uh, you know, and Macron very much embodies. But I think, um, yeah, like, so you see people like Bernard Stiegler, who, whose thought largely represents an effort to comprehend uh, the changes in terms of digitization that affects society, um, but yeah. to do so in, like, a, a left phenomenological. And you, I, think, I think you're going to help, right? Uh, the, yeah, yeah, tech is a time machine, right? Tech, the only time machine is technology. Mm -hmm. That's Stiegler, right? Uh, I'm missing yeah, something yeah. there. Well, I think, yeah, I think, I think, like, again, like, I have to, I have to go through and, like, I look through more of it, because, like, I'm not an expert. I've read a few of his books. But, yeah, I mean, I think, I understand, I think he does, uh, certainly he talks about, like, the constitution of memory and time, right? Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, of course, techniques and time. How stupid am I, right? Yeah, of course, like, uh, in which, like, temporality itself becomes, like, a consequence of the use of certain techniques, right? So yeah. it's an ambitious, it's an ambitious reading of mm -hmm. Simon Don in relation to uh, phenomenology. Right to try to map the relationship between phenomenology and technology, um, and yeah. then also to try to, uh, and this is developed throughout his body of work to apply that in a left wing or resistant manner. And of course, this this in, this trammels up so many contradictions. Uh, these different readings that are synthesized uh, that it ends up kind of failing. You know, like it can't it can't succeed structurally. But it is like we said about all of Elliot's readings. Uh, well, it is a productive failure. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Like. I do when I when I was sort of looking at Stiegler, I did notice that it, there's a lot of rhetoric. But I think that that core idea, uh, and maybe not a lot of rhetoric, but um, but it's, it seemed like to have a rhetorical sort of bent to it. Um, I I need to go through it more, but um, but I I like I do like that main concept, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go through that. I'm gonna try to get it through as much of technics in time because Stiegler is gonna come on. You're gonna interview him, correct? I believe so. If Doug, because like everything with Doug is a bit like iffy right now, but like if everything works out, then uh, he should be on. It might on be on zero. Or it, it, well, it should be. It should be. It should be on zero. I don't like. I don't feel comfortable bringing him on here because it's not a big enough um, venue. I think to book his time. Um, but on the okay. other hand, on the other hand, it's like he might just not notice. So because he probably doesn't know. This well, he probably wouldn't. Anyway. But I mean, if it doesn't work out with Doug, no. It I could. Be. Yeah, I'd like to. I just like if it doesn't work out with Doug, I just like it for him to be clear uh, the context so that he can make a, an informed decision with it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, no, cause, you know, he he he's a he's a pretty big big guy in France. Like, um, but yeah, like what you were saying about about this literacy. I mean, I don't think people in the English world actually understand the difference. Like, I like I don't think they actually get it. Like. Uh, that, like I told you, every year there's a uh, Fête uh, Humanité, 500,000 people come to a Marxist festival where they eat cordon bleu and have wine and baguette, whatever, um, you know, and they have like, you have Iggy Pop and the Cuban newspaper, the grandma there, and you'll have cotton candy or whatever, it's bizarre. Um, that's every year, that's the same amount of people as Woodstock, 
right? You've got several like palpably left wing left wing papers, the Humanite, Humanite, which is like actually Marxist, Liberation, uh, and uh, Le Monde Diplomatique. This is before you get to the Le Monde, which is broadly, you know, social democrat being there very, very soft left, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, so, you know, and it's a whole different context. So uh, in the, before, before in the <laughs> 60s and 70s, I'm just going to say, uh, the C French Communist Party controlled the most prestigious educational institutes in the country, right? UNS, Sorbonne. Imagine if the American Communist Party controlled Harvard, right? How that would affect like intellectual cultures. Ellie, yeah, really. What do you think of this? We rebrand the channel as a philosophy, politics, talk channel. And then if it doesn't work out with Doug, we bring him on here. We rebranded our. <laughs> so, we, so we move my name because yeah. right now it just says Elliot Rosenstock. We could rebrand it. We could, we could make a nicer logo. <laughs> sure, well, let's talk about that after the. I don't like disclosing all this to So let's talk about that after the. Behind the scenes. I like to throw in a little behind the scenes. That's the postmodern thing to do. It's the, it's yeah. the subtle, it's the fake behind the scenes. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, wink. The, the English. Yeah. I just want to say that the English speaking left is basically like in a position right now where uh, there's been a certain, uh, you know, again, it's, a, it's, there's been, it's positive for it. The continental philosophy got a lot bigger after 1980. I mean, you had like these absurd things after 1980 where you had like Americans who were reading uh, Plato after they read Derrida because they heard Plato was mentioned in Derrida. Um, you know, that was how little knowledge there often was about continental philosophy. So that helped, uh, which has to do with the internationalization of knowledge. But then you also have this post-recessionary leftist surge um, and when you see the results of that being yoked together, you're seeing some productivity. But I'm saying a lot of stuff is like pretty much existing um, at a level, like there's still institutional marginalization. Um, there is still, uh, you know, a lack of scholarly recognition. Um, and a lot of the stuff, there is, a, there's an insufficient uh, connection between uh, the Marxist intellectual ideas and the sort of uh, propaganda and vulgarizing like current affairs, right? Um, yeah. So I said that those links have, are not well established as well, which is a serious issue. And now we're seeing current affairs declare war on the Marxist left. So, you know, great. Yeah, and you know, if you read, even reading like hitting the translate button, even reading like French papers, the level of analysis is, is so much not the prefabricated narratives. So much is my impression of it is you you tend to get like a a higher quality of analysis. It almost makes me like like what are we gonna do here? Because it's you know even the socialist sort of parts. Tend to tend to move towards this sort of vulgar promotion of the signifier of socialism, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, it's it's yeah, like when you read something like Le Monde Diplomatique, it's just so bizarre to read. Like I read like a long article in Le Monde Diplomatique about how um, about how um, like Julian Assange is like attacked by uh, journalists, um, mm -hmm. but that he's attacked by them because. His transgression of establishment journalistic standards actually allowed him to do more rigorous journalism. So went into a lot of detail about how thoroughly vetted WikiLeaks was, like, you know, and how like they've never basically never released incorrect information. And there's like a whole, you know, and it's just information I'd never received in the English speaking world or a perspective exactly. you'd never find in like a um so again, you really have to shift that whole basis. What if we want to get back to Marxism and, and say, you know, you really have to shift that whole, you have to work, you know, it's not enough. Just have these theories about like communization theories like after the value form or anything like that you really really have to embrace principles of organization um you know build a media build a political base uh build forms of uh working class organization and that's the way you're going to win right yeah should we should we well, does anybody else to say or should we wrap it yeah let's wrap it up it's like two hours yeah yeah okay well uh thank you guys for coming out uh we yeah, got you. a little bit off track at the end but i hope in general you find our uh our commentary enriching uh just we marxist oh, oh, oh. Um, <laughs> and uh this was uh um uh zero books basement uh capital discussion group uh chapter 14 uh and for everyone who's watching can we do for the next chapter do you guys want to do half of chapter 15 because it's extremely long um mm. i suggest that we go to page 565 oh, which would be 75 pages that's a big one you have to bite off but we got to get this book done 75 pages okay. isn't too much. So can we do that? Is that good with you guys? Yeah, so all the way to part five. Uh, no, oh, to part, part five, part six. To yeah. part six of, chap of chapter 15. Yeah, yeah. Does that work? To page yeah. 565, does that work? Okay. okay, so we'll be coming back and we'll be discussing the, the enormous, I think one of the best and most interesting uh, chapters in Capital, 
uh, the enormous chapter on machinery and large scale industry, which I think has a lot of resonances uh, with accelerationist uh, and also sort of post-humanist discourse in general. So it'd be great to talk about uh, next week. All right. Perfect. Thanks, guys. So, yeah, absolutely. So long, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and.